tactics is probably what some of those guys take themselves to know loads about. And I don't really know anything about that, to be honest. But yeah, I guess they, my point is I just wasn't talking it. about that. Yeah, they've been using this example like, well, for example, if we had a, something about the space landing or the moon landing, and we had a transcript and it says the eagle has landed, you're uh -huh. just taking it to be like, literally the eagle has landed. And I said, no, you right, called out right, specifically, right. you're not, like you, you can, can make an it. objection to the semantics, but not to the logic. I mean, maybe the eagle has landed is some like idiom that's being used and, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't actually mean for something there is an eagle and such that it has landed or whatever. Exactly. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, so it's like yeah, the yeah. interpretation of the non-logical terms, right, is... The eagle has landed means like the spaceship has, I mean, landed probably just yeah. does mean landed realistically. It's just the right, term right. eagle is referring, you know, allegorically or something. But mm -hmm. I was okay with the word murderer being used like that in the argument, right? I wasn't being petty and saying, oh, you yeah, think you, you hate someone and you've killed them. Yeah, I wasn't all saying you were that. asking was that they use it the same way each time. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. No, but and and the question is just should we pass them. out as two conditionals? And it just seems like obviously yeah. yes, at least prima facie. <laughs> and like I was yeah. saying, I'd be open to someone who had a good grasp of the linguistics who was able to say something like, that's a terrible translation. And actually, you know, the Greek word wasn't if or every or whatever. And there was some actual reason to think that the English sentence mischaracterized the logical form of the original, whatever it was, Greek or Aramaic or whatever language it was written. I mean, I'm open to me getting it wrong, but I just think, I, well, I'm open to like the English sentence being misleading, but I just don't understand what the alternative approach to anal analyzing the logical form would be. Um, I mean, I mean so, what yeah. about if at the beginning of the epistle it said, and every time I say if, I mean and. <laughs> like... <laughs> yeah, okay, conceivably, because then what we're talking about is some, like, it's it's been deliberately, like, subverting the normal way you would analyze it or something. Like, it's, right, it's right, understanding right. that, like, the following passages, if analyzed without this caveat, would standardly mean this, mm -hmm. but I'm going to hereby mm -hmm. declare that they don't mean that or something. I mean, maybe, right. but the point is, it doesn't say that, right? It doesn't say right, anything right, like that. right, right, right. And it, we have no reason to believe that there's anything that would change the logical structure of it right yeah and, that, and at least the first pass reading should be this and right. then it's just a question of like right. what overcomes that and that, i just think that the idea oh, that and no one no one has provided an alternate logical form <laughs> surprisingly well no i think john did i think he said there was a hidden premise which well, said um right. if d then not c right that should be the third premise Right, so it would be, well, it would be if oh, A, then he B. he was importing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, would, he just invented a third premise and said that's how right, you should right. read it. But there mm -hmm. was no kind of grammatical support for that. Like, there right. wasn't a third premise written. Um, and, or, you know, it didn't really come... Because it's just like, I mean, the argument is supposed to result in some sort of contradiction being shown, right? And, you know, adding an extra premise to something that shows a contradiction won't make it not show a contradiction. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. I think I didn't really pause to like think about what the logical form, like what the implications would be of that logical form, because I was just sort of brushing it aside, like, doesn't really matter. Um, like, well done, you've thought of a new, like possible logical form or something, but it doesn't really matter when analyzing this sentence or something. But yeah, I think that's right. I don't think it like actually helps with the basic puzzle to just set, just like suppose a new premise was was there. I think that's right. So well, well, anyway, that's it has fine. gotten it has gotten old, some Christians to quote unquote bite the bullet and say, well then it must be the case that uh, no Christian has ever murdered. Uh -huh. Well even hated <laughs> or or hated, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah, well, that's you, something I've been arguing for a while, though. I mean, the, I mean even if that was true, that's just going to be the con the conclusion from your beliefs. I don't. But the point, the point of the correct. argument is to yeah, show that, you know, given that that's true, you just have a way of telling who is a Christian and who is not. Yeah, yeah, but so there's something weird about exactly. that. Exactly. Thank you. 
I don't really understand what is the passage doing there if Christians can't hate other Christians. Mm -hmm. What's the point of the passage? Well, I don't. Same, I mean, what I'm saying is Tom and I are actually agreeing on that passage. No, no, no. Oh, the Tom. point is, point is, on your reading, it sounds like they're saying, don't do this impossible thing. They, don't do this thing that you're unable to do. Right? Worse than that. It's, yeah. hey, guys, make sure you don't do this thing that you can't possibly do, because if you do this thing that it's impossible for you to do, there's this thing that will happen, which is impossible to happen to you, which is you'll lose your internal life. Right, which is very Wait, undesirable, you, but can't are happen. Are you getting that from the logical form of that statement? We're talking about your view. Well, I'm I'm trying to figure out where you're – are you getting that from the – because Tom had the same view I did. That's the point. He's got the, he posted the syllogism right there on the screen you don't, when he did you don't the video. Think you don't think Christians can hate other Christians, right? No, I don't think they can. Right. So what's the point yeah. of a passage saying, hey, guys, here's this thing that you can't do that you shouldn't do. But don't worry, you can't do it, right? But don't do it even though you can't do it, right? Because if you were able to do it, which you're not, there's this horrible consequence, right? which is that you'd lose your eternal life. But that can't happen. Well, you're not getting that from that statement, though. What are you talking about? That. We're asking you what is the it. purpose of the passage. The logical, as Alex Malpass is saying, the logical form of that statement is not saying what We're you just said. We're asking you what the purpose and of I'm the not, passage is. So how do you want me to answer this? Do you want me to answer it going outside of that passage? I mean, I'm asking what the purpose of the passage is. Well, let's read it. Let me look it up here. Give me a second. Y'all can talk while we look it up. I don't know well, why we have. How many I times feel like we all have it committed to memory. How many times have we yeah, read it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's read it. I mean, like, yeah, we know like, that we know. Right? Right? Whenever you hate your brother, hey, like, you no are idea, a murderer, and, we, and you know that no murderer has everlasting life residing in him. Yeah, so the, yeah, okay. I think that point is so right. everyone, okay. everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So uh -huh. he's saying here, anyone who hates his brother does not have eternal life, right? That's just the basic form of the statement. Mm -hmm. Now, someone who, a Christian, someone who's accepted Christ as their Savior, we would assume, according to Scripture, other passages has eternal life. So since eternal life is not abiding in him, then John's saying he's not a Christian. That's what it seems like to me, he's saying. Right? Well, I, I didn't and then, then, you were say, then you were saying that, um, y'all were saying that this meant your fellow brother meaning fellow believer. But if, I don't know where you get that unless you, if you're just being consistent in the, for the logical form or whatever. Unless you're reading outside of scripture to interpret it that way. Because I, love, I love the way that even though he's been corrected on this point, he can't let it go because of the what well, I don't think Alex Malpass would agree disagree with me here. Because earlier on in the very passage, he's talking about Cain and Abel. Well, Cain, Abel, Cain was never a believer. Cain killed Abel. So is he? T why? Why do you think he's talking about a Christian? These Christians uh, killing each other, and not that just someone, you know, something else. Where do you get that from? Well, obviously you're not following the logical form of that verse. There, you're going yeah. outside of scripture you to get saying, that. Right? You keep saying logical form. Do you understand what that is? Yeah, he was talking about some sort of if, then, if, that if you, if you, if you hate your brother, then you don't have everlasting life, right? That's exactly right, man. That's what the logical form is. Yeah. Now, when you start start <laughs> interpreting it as they were, that there's a, other, that this was a brother, a fellow Christian hating another fellow Christian, 
I'm wondering how they get that from that logical form. They can't get it from how that logical form. They have to go somewhere else. Well, hold on a sec. Um, the, the logical form, it seemed to me, was um, syllogism, right? It's, it's not really if A, then B. I think I was talking like that in the moment. And that's kind of, um, it's like broadly right, but I think slightly more precisely, you'd want to say something like, um, you'd want to use quantification because, I mean, the first word of that verse is everyone, right? And that is a quantifier. Um, so it's something like all A's are B, right? Um, no B's are C. Therefore, no A's are C. Like that's the logical form, specifically. And then, if what you're doing is quantifying over everyone in the first word of the first line, right? Everyone who's who hates their brother is a murderer. Then it's perfectly reasonable then to pick out a specific individual and start reasoning about well, what would it say about this one person then, right? That's like if I said. Everyone who lives in England is a prick, right? And then you could say, well, don't you live in England? I'm like, oh, yeah, Christ, I've just said that I'm a prick, right? So perfectly reasonable to do that. To, to, if you're quantifying, saying a universal statement to then, like, pick out an individual and, like, follow the reasoning through for them. So doesn't that seem straightforward to do that? Like, if you're saying, you know, no, uh, any, any Christian who hates their brother is a murderer or something. And then to start saying, well, what about if, like, John hated his brother? Would he be a murderer? That's reasonable, isn't it? You're saying there's something wrong with that. Yeah, I actually think that is reasonable. Yeah, I would agree. Well, isn't that what, what was going on, though? Yes, I mean, it seems like you were y'all were trying to say that John was, this, was wrong for assuming that you can be a Christian and hate your brother and have murder in your heart. I'm actually agreeing with that. I think John would be wrong as, uh, to assume that based on Scripture. But I also think that that is concluded not just by that, that passage itself, but other scripture as well. But so, so I, I, I take your Christian. I, th I think, yourself, I, right? yeah, I actually agree with what Tom was saying. And here's Tom's argument. He actually said in, in the, uh, let's see, I still got it. Premise one, if you hate your brother, you are a murderer. Premise mm -hmm. two, if you're a murderer, you do, do not have everlasting life, a.k.a. Yeah. you're not a Christian. Conclusion, if you hate your brother, you don't have everlasting life, a.k.a. you're not a Christian. I don't disagree with that. I think that's fine. Okay. So what, what do you have a point of contention then? I thought <laughs> it seemed to me like you were objecting <laughs> to something. <laughs> well, the, the, the point, uh, what I was saying is that argument, if he wants to go there, there was a couple of things. The points of contention that I think everybody was confused about, and I may be wrong with Sully. Sully may have a different point of contention, but there was a, a timestamp in which you had said at the one hour, four minute, 45 second mark. And maybe you misspoke or may or it, you know, but I even looked at the transcript and it, it's it's saying hermeneutics is insane. This is crazy. Like, that's not how you understand the logical form of a sentence is by what right, other right, sentences right. surround it, which I don't necessarily disagree with that last part. You're just looking at the logical form of the sentence. You're not looking at others around it. But when you said hermeneutics is crazy, that was what I think a lot of people kind of, what's he mean by that? So maybe you misspoke. I'm not sure. Yeah. So I, I didn't say, I mean, maybe the transcript meant, meant it like this. I didn't say hermeneutics, like the subject matter of hermeneutics is crazy. That's, that's certainly not what I, uh, I don't think that's what I said, but it maybe Mike issues muted the first word of mine or something, but like, I, I meant that his, his hermeneutics was crazy. Like his approach to interpreting, uh, that passage. But I even think the word hermeneutics was just a mistake. I just shouldn't have said that. I should okay. have just said, the way you're analyzing the logical form of this sentence is crazy. But I think in the okay. moment, it just slipped out as a way of trying to communicate that quickly. So that's probably, yeah, that's probably, that's understandable because it may have been you had mic issues because when you said that, I was like, what in the world is he saying? And then, at, but at the minute, four minute, 31 second mark, you said something about what if I rip out all the pages, would you read the middle of the page differently? Then all mm. of a sudden you, you, and it's, you know, the way the transcript is and how it sounds. And what if you didn't know 
uh, those other pages. Now, I would agree with you. I think anyone would agree that if there's a passage of scripture here, we we would and er, there was nothing else surrounding. It was just a statement. Then then, yeah, we would read it and just kind of take it at its face value reading. But if there was nothing else, but obviously if it was in context of a lot of other statements, then obviously we would read it differently. So it could have, like Sully had mentioned, the eagle has landed. You know, if we just took the statement, the eagle has landed, then obviously we just might think that someone's just talking about an eagle. Maybe it landed somewhere. But when you start adding all this other context, then obviously it's talking about something very different than what the statement might appear to be saying from the beginning. Did you hear me talk about this a minute ago? No, I didn't. I just come in. I see. Okay. So I, I think Tom already brought this up with me right at the beginning a few minutes ago. So, I mean, I think you just need to distinguish between um, what, what I was talking about, which was parsing the logical form of a sentence, right? That's a certain type of analysis that you can do. And what you're talking about, which is understanding the meaning of the non-logical terms, right? So eagle, for instance, isn't a logical term. It's not a connector. It's not an operator. It's not quantifies. It's not brackets. Nothing like that, right? It's a it's just, um, a referring term. What what it refers to is not dictated by logic, right? It's, it's about whatever societal context you come from and how they use that word and what they they take it to refer to or whatever, right? And so I'm not talking about that. I don't care what the words mean. I wasn't interested. So for instance, I wasn't nitpicking and saying, oh, anyone who hates their brother is a murderer. But that's crazy because you can hate someone without killing them. I wasn't making that argument. I wasn't, I don't care about, you tell me what murderer means and I'll just sign off on that without talking to you. I wouldn't dispute that in any way. And that might be the proper purview of hermeneutics and you might be an expert in hermeneutics and you might be the best person to tell me in that context what murderer means that's absolutely fine but what i'm saying is if you want to work out whether you know is that um two conditionals or a biconditional or um should it be read as some kind of subjunctive blah 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 whatever the logical form of that is not a question of hermeneutics that's why i think i just misled everyone by saying the word hermeneutics i just shouldn't have said that and i do stand by the idea that you want to work out what the logical form of a sentence is. There's got nothing to do with the non-logical terms, like what they mean or anything. Forgetting that, if you just want to know what is, what is the structure logically of this sentence, it doesn't matter what came before or after. It's, it's completely irrelevant. And I just don't, I just yeah, don't think it, that, you know, there's much dispute about that. I don't even think John Lee would have disputed that, but I think when you, because I was, when I went back and listened to it and you talked about uh, hermeneutics is crazy and I think your mic went out there. And then John, one of the statements John said was scripture interprets scripture, you know, implying, well, we get a deeper understanding by other scripture, which is, you know, everybody does that. Um, So I think, would it be, do you think because of you using the word hermeneutics, um, and then talking about the logical form and, and maybe John was hearing uh, something, maybe thinking about hermeneutics that maybe y'all were just talking past each other at that point. Well, because I think that's, that's what it seems bit... like maybe was going on uh, now from my perspective. I, d- I don't know. I think that's, um, I'm, I, I, I don't know if you even have any idea who I am, but I'm not like normally, um, uncharitable to people right i try and be balanced and and fair and stuff but i do think that's a slightly too charitable reading of what john was saying there just realistically i just don't think that he got thrown just by my use of the word hermeneutics because i think he actually understood enough of what my criticism was to actually um defend the idea that you do read you you do have justification from the surrounding passages to pass the logical form as having a hidden premise I mean, what was all that stuff about him saying there should be a hidden premise there? Right? It seems quite clear to me what he was saying at the time was the context in other places, um, in John or whatever, other parts of the Bible too, the idea is that um, a murderer, uh, someone could hate their brother and be a murderer but then be forgiven and then not lose eternal life. Right? So he had a third premise which meant that you could do that and not lose 
eternal life because after all he thinks he's saved so if he hates on a christian he just wouldn't be a murderer because of this third premise kind of negating well he'd be a murderer but it wouldn't have any consequences for his soteriology because it would negate that that's what this third premise was doing so i just think he was quite clearly and straightforwardly saying that you can you can have like license or something to sort of uh, read um, the logical form being different to what I was saying, right? There was a hidden premise that was his idea. So I, I think yeah, actually, you misreading actually what was happening. Find, you know. Yeah, and it could be the case actually, and I've even said this, I kind of had a problem with what he was saying here. Um, so that could be the case, but it did seem like there was a misunderstanding because I know that there's um, multiple people that heard the conversation and one had kind of said that you were promoting what he called extreme cherry picking. Um, he didn't actually, he used a different philosophical term, but he was kind of saying to the extreme, but it's the same thing as cherry picking. And I think they may have got that from maybe you, your mic messing up there where you're talking about, you know, hermeneutics is insane. Instead of maybe thinking you saying that John's hermeneutics is insane, which that can yeah. have a, you know, that could definitely cause some confusion. And then the part where you were talking about, well, what if I ripped out all the other pages from the Bible and just that page? Um, and it may have been that they concluded that you were trying to say that you're not allowed to, you only have to just focus on what that says. You can't interpret it outside of that. And I could, I heard you talking about logical form. It took me a while to figure it out because I'm not this philosophical minded heavyweight. But once I started figuring out what you were saying, I was like, well, I kind of see where he's saying here. You just read it at face value. It says what it says is kind of, you know, what you're saying. But if that's all you're saying, I I'm not real sure. I guess it, I guess the reason why it's a problem for John is he's trying to make it say more than what it's saying is is what I'm I'm guessing. Um, because if that's all yeah. you're saying, I don't think anybody would disagree with that. Even Christian, okay. atheist, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, well, but I could not, see um, if you're thinking that John is con coming to a different conclusion based off of just that, then sure, I could see where that would be problematic. But yeah, John's John, insisting he's getting it from somewhere else, other interpretation, other passages. Yeah, so I just think that um, because other passages say something different, and he takes that to be the proper, um, the proper way to say it, that um when john said something that's just different to that he must have meant to um imply a hidden premise otherwise it would conflict with what he knows the true message of the bible to be so he's just adding in a premise in order to maintain his interpretation of those other passages right so that's that's what he's doing there he's he's just adding in not because the grammar shows that it should be there but just because Otherwise, his understanding of what the other passages say would be in conflict with what it says here. And that, and that just does seem to me ad hoc. I mean, what, he's only doing it to salvage his own view. Right? It's the only reason he's saying that. I'll give another passage to him. He wouldn't just come up with it being a hidden premise there. There's no evidence of it being a hidden premise. He just thinks there must be. Otherwise, John would be conflicting with something else that John said. right? And people do that when they're interpreting... Like Aristotle, right, the, is, is even worse to read than a, an ancient text like the book of John, because in Aristotle's um, books, I think in all of them, I'm not sure, I don't know if Dan's in the room, he, he might know, but I think all of the Aristotle's works are um, note, notes yeah. taken by a third person, right? So it's not That's actually the, Aristotle's right. work, right? Right, right, good. So when people deeply try and go in to construct what the you know form of an argument that's given is um sometimes he'll say something and then like a, that one way of rendering a premise they'll find that you know if you scroll back 30 pages he he denies that same thing that that you've just reckoned is the, the right way to read what he's saying um further down in the in the passage um and then and, you know there's an interpretive difficulty there like did Aristotle contradict himself? Did the scribe write one of them wrong? Which one was it? Uh, did, are they both wrong? Whatever. Like there's some kind of indeterminacy there. But it's okay because Aristotle isn't an infallible being. It's you know he he could have just made a bunch of mistakes. He might be internally inconsistent. You know so what? Like 
So you, sometimes you just have to construct, like, well, this is an argument you could make when you're reading Aristotle. Who cares exactly whether it's what Aristotle really meant, right? Um, and I think that there's something difficult about, you know, you, we, maybe a different bit of John gives a different argument and this bit of John conflicts with that. It seems to me um, quite possible that that's what's going on. That seems to be John seemed to think there were loads of passages that supported a different, you know, direction of argument that conflicted with the one that we were looking at. And I might want to resolve that in the same sort of way and say, well, you know, maybe John was sloppy on this occasion. He didn't express the argument correctly or something. Um, right. We don't have the option of saying maybe the scribe wrote it down wrong, like we do with Aristotle, as far as I know. You know, it's not like that with the book of John. It's not notes taken by someone else who listened to him dictate it or something. It's actually him writing it, whoever he was. Um, but, you know, it's going to be quite difficult for you to say, well, I guess he just wrote it down wrong or something. Because, you know, you want to say that it's all divinely inspired and, and infallible, right? So you can't say that. Isn't that right? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so then there's a difficulty, why... isn't there? All yeah, that you're doing by pointing I... out that Sorry, just one last little bit. The incongruence between this passage and other parts of the Bible, in my view, doesn't license you to read in a hidden premise necessarily. I mean, that seems like a tall order. But what it does is present a kind of, you know, um, a problem, an interpretive problem that you have to work out. Like, how come the logical form here contradicts the um, similar argument made on a different passage, right? How come that um, incongruence between the two passages? Um, so yeah, I think that you know, if you don't if well, you don't would, take the movie he's making, that's that's kind of a puzzle in yourself. Right? I think that would be something John would have to work out because I'm actually agreeing with these premises and this conclusion. Uh, because if you look at oh. other passages of scripture, you actually see where there's other premises that would support this premise, where Jesus says, hey, right. okay. "If you if you love me, you will keep my commandments. A new commandment I give you." As you have, as I have loved you, so shall you love one another. So I do have a problem with someone saying, oh, yeah, a Christian can have hate in their heart for another person okay. and be a Christian. So, yeah, I'm agreeing with you there. I think that the biggest confusion, at least from my part, and now it seems like we've solved it, is when you were talking about ripping all the pages out and then, then you said hermeneutics is insane and then it appears that your mic messed up and you were actually saying your hermeneutics is insane. Yeah, definitely. And yeah. so that kind of resolves the issues I have. But maybe uh, you could, John's in the room, maybe you could talk with John about that. But I actually do have a problem with people saying, yeah, a Christian so, can have hate in their heart for their brother. Just to, just to be clear, so I can kind of wrap this up and then we can move on a little bit. But you're saying that you don't have any problem with Alex's argumentation anymore? I don't have any, I never had any problem with it anyway, because he was agreeing uh, with your conclusion. Well, let me, I'm yeah. looking here at my notes and I have you quoted as, if Alex gave that argument to his peers or colleagues, they would probably demand that they, that he give back his degree. Be stripped out. Yeah. Be stripped of his philosophical <laughs> degree. Okay. Yeah. So that, that was your way of agreeing with him? Well, I mean, time? when you, when, <laughs> when you hear hermeneutics is insane then uh yeah i would think that that would be true right hermeneutics is insane that's and what you actually and, and thought crazy. he was saying that's what that's you actually what he, he that's saying. what the that's what he actually did say in the recording but he said uh, his mic messed up no he didn't so, I, I i would actually challenge you to give me a timestamp for that i don't think one don't think hour four minute and 45 second mark there's so he's no talking your about... hermeneutics the endeavor of hermeneutics is the same. That's that's what you think he was saying. That's what it sounded like to me. Yes. <laughs> and then, the, and then hermeneutics and then when reading Aristotle. Previously, previously at the one minute, uh, the one hour, four minute, thirty one second mark, he says, "What if I ripped out all the pages? Would you read the middle page differently?" Then, so when you go with that first statement, previous statement, and then you hear him say hermeneutics is insane but yet he's saying your hermeneutics is insane obviously that's a big difference then that's kind of what i was concluding and that's why i was saying hey if he said that in front of a bunch of philosophers or a bunch of someone like josh bowen or something then they would laugh him off the stage or matt dillahunty but um 
he's not saying that there was just some sort of, you know, mess up there. And I guess what he was saying here with this other one was he's just basically saying he's just talking about reading it in his logical form. Um, that's it. Only just reading in his logical form. And he's not saying, oh, you're getting a deeper meaning by that. You're just reading in his logical form. But yeah. he, he, I'm sure he would agree getting into the deeper meaning would mean going to other passages and things like that. Yeah, well, I think it's outside. interesting that Matt Matt doesn't think that this reading creates any difficulties for his position, right? I mean, on his understanding right, of all yeah. these different terms, the passage actually means nothing, as Jack was alluding to earlier. Well, no, I mean, I think what Tom's – I don't have a problem with Tom's argument. Tom obviously – took meaning from that passage. That's my point. So to say it means nothing would be to undermine Tom's beautiful argument here. Oh my God. Where did you say this was? I'm looking at one minute, oh sorry, one hour, four minutes. So the one funny. at the one hour, four minute, 31 second mark, he says, what if I ripped out all the pages? Would you read that middle page differently? Well, the answer could very well be. No, yes, I'm asking obviously. for when you you're claiming that the Alex one hour, said hermeneutics is insane. Where is that? One hour, four minute, and forty five second marks. Same minute, just fifteen seconds later. I mean, I'm you looking at the transcript. Afford. It says, and what you didn't know it does, was it on the. Does, he does it. It leaves out the word hermeneutics. I had to go back because I heard the word hermeneutics and I was following the transcript as it was going. It didn't put. Her, it didn't catch hermeneutics. So you're hearing it in the recording when he said it. So if you yeah, just I think I did say, it, say yeah. I think I either said this hermeneutics is, is insane or your hermeneutics is insane. I said one of those two. I didn't say hermeneutics is insane, and um, it, and it, doesn't, what, it wouldn't yeah. make any sense it, it, in the context, yeah. right, for me to suddenly change what we we're talking about and start um, criticizing the field of hermeneutics. I mean, what's that got to do with what we were talking about? Well, see, that I was, was obviously was saying. Confusing. Yeah, that right. was what was so confusing yeah. because just 15 seconds earlier, you were talking about what if I ripped out all the pages? So it right. seemed like you were but, saying hermeneutics is insane. We shouldn't do it. And now that you've explained it, I can see there was just some confusion based off of scientific failures and just, you know, oh, the confusion second. of the whole thing. But yeah, so I think, now, you know, I don't really have an issue now. Look, let me just, My, wrap, I, let me just, oh, let me just clear this up really quickly. I'm just going to play it. Alex does not say what you said he said. Listen. Not see. Look, what if I ripped out all the pages? Would you read that middle page differently then? <laughs> now all of a sudden, you. And what if you didn't know what was on the other pages? Mm. So, How would so, you read it? Okay. Well, like, what? Then... This hermeneutics is insane. Mm. So, so, I think I said quite clearly. There you go. This you go. Hermeneutics yeah, is yeah. insane. This is insane. Play it. You're not going to hear him say your hermeneutics. He's just said no, hermeneutics. This hermeneutics is insane. Yeah, That's okay. Well, okay. Yeah. Well, maybe I didn't. Yeah, the word this was clearly there. Yeah. Okay. So I, that's I now. I thought that that's... you. It must have been somehow muted because you didn't hear it. But on the playback, then it's pretty clear. I said this. I think it doesn't even me. say it in my transcript. I don't. Let me check my transcript. Let's see. Well, you just, look, oh. you just heard it. I mean, it doesn't matter. Just, just, I know, but what I'm it. saying yeah. is, I didn't, maybe I didn't from that, it's a different video. I didn't look, hear it. Look, Sasha, so that's stop where trolling. the confusion was. Yeah. Inverted I, did, I was on, 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 on a laptop. I was listening to it on my phone. But my point was, when I heard when he when he was talking about ripping out all the other pages, and then I heard that, then between those two, um, it seemed like what he was saying was he was dissing hermeneutics. Well, but if you go to the other passages. Where where Alex talks, then <laughs> it seems like he's dissing hermeneutics again. Yeah, I'll so give you, you another you, example. You retract, you retract it, right? You know now what? No, he actually, said. actually, it's still because he started using the example of a bank. You wouldn't get to go to the bank. And no, um, look, listen, listen, I'm hold on. Look, down. We're taking one thing at a time. Wrong. We're taking one thing at a time. <laughs> you made a claim that Alex said hermeneutics is insane. Full stop. Yes. That's what you were saying. Is insane. Yes. And, and, and we, would, we just listened to it. That's not what he said, right? I, I can't hear. You'll have to play well, it again. But those I words were perfect. Even your were hermeneutics is insane. He said, This hermeneutics is insane with reference to how John is, is doing it. Okay, yeah, so. In that you're, sentence, you're hermeneutics saying, is insane. Okay, all right. Stop with all the trolling. Else is keep interrupting. 
when he says, if I rip out all the pages, would you read look, the look, page Look, hold on, hold on a second. And look, yes, hey, would. shut up. Yeah. Hey, I'm just, I'm just taking things one at a time. Okay. Do you now recognize, he said, this hermeneutics is yes. insane. Okay. I already recognize that because he's, what he said earlier, he said I was saying his, I already recognize that. You didn't. But what I'm saying is. Right, right. I so so you were wrong about yet. that. So let's go to the next thing. Well, I wasn't what wrong. Else? What do you mean? Because it actually doesn't. He doesn't say. I don't hear him say this in the in the recording. We, we just know, listened to everyone it. Everyone else heard it. We I know. Play, I'm only. Can play it again. I'm play it again and let me see. If oh I my can God! Hear. Fine. I'll, fine. I'll play on it my, again. After that, admit you were wrong and let's guys, move on. on. On my computer, I can't hear it either. I think. It Thank you. On really? Computer, you. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm not I'm lying, lying here. I heard it. What do you mean? Me. Depends on it. Depends on it. Look, what if I... No, it's not about you not being a blind light. Just, just, just shut up. I can't hear you. you and what if you did what was on the other page? Oh, okay. Wow. Like, what? Then. This hermeneutics is insane. Do you not... So, so, so okay. I still have it. This hermeneutics is insane. Pages. So, so, okay. Like, what? This hermeneutics is insane. Pages. So, so, Yeah, I mean, I don't hear it. Like, what? This hermeneutics is insane. Are you guys hearing anything? Yes, I heard this, your multiple this, this hermeneutic is, is, what, this is insane. It sounds like it sounds this like this hermeneutic is insane. This hermeneutic is insane. I'm not hearing what he's this hermeneutic thing. It's this like, hermeneutic like, is insane. It's like John Lee and him start talking, and then he's trying to say something. It's like it. It's also, it does sound like he's trying to say something, but he says hermeneutic <laughs> is insane. But I don't hear this at all from my end. This hermeneutics is insane. That's what he says. Okay, well, look. We'll agree that I just misheard that. Can you yeah. narrow it down yeah. to just the word this? Okay, now, so that's taken care of. Now we've taken care of you. You now agree with the logic. Uh, and so I, I assume that with regard to that, if you made the claim that if his colleagues heard him saying that he would, um, they would demand that they take away his degree. I, I assume now that you agree with the argument, you take back that also. No, I still have a problem with what if I ripped out all the pages? Would you read the middle page differently? Of course, people would possibly read it differently. That's weird. Why? Why would they? Hold on, though. What's the? What did because I it, actually reading, say? Hold on. Hold on. A, hold on. A hold on a sec. Hold on a second. What did I actually say? Can we pull up the actual quotes from that bit too? Yes, he, it he says, it. what if I ripped out all the pages? Would you read that middle page differently? Oh, I see. I actually said read today. Well, according yeah. to the transcript, yeah. Yeah, because I think quite often in the discussion, which was like two hours long, right? I was, I was careful to say repeatedly about passing the logical form of the sentence, which obviously is, you know, the word read means a bunch of different things, of course, right? And one way of understanding what what to say is like reading the passage would mean understanding the message in terms of the gospel and you know what does the word murderer mean right? how do i know what that means i need to like figure out like that's a reading of the passage or something but the the sense i think it's i mean i hope, hope it's clear because i said so many times over and over again that what i'm talking about is working out what the logical form of the sentence is not what the meaning of the non-logical terms are that like that's what I meant is if you had ripped out all the other pages of the book, I'm thinking of like a logic textbook. If you rip out the other pages that surround it, it wouldn't make any difference to um, a, a sentence in the middle, exp you know, expressing a proposition or something. You'd still read that. You'd still pass the logical form right in the same way because it, it's sure. not a book that sure. carries like allegorical meaning or anything. It's a logic textbook, so you would. There's no other like the type of analysis you need to do apart from that so like and that right. just seems right i mean and i think that's true of the bible too if you take out the surrounding passages you'd still pass the logical form of the sentence you're looking at in the same way it wouldn't make any difference what the surrounding yes. passages are you would, okay you so would, you would also yeah. agree with that i would agree as well. with that yeah okay so but what's the when problem you say, when you say read it differently then you, you said you use the word read there i kind of took that and you know maybe this is my mistake uh but I kind of took that as reading it in the sense when you're saying read it differently, um, it almost implies that it's possible to read it differently. And sure, 
people would read it differently, just like the eagle has landed if they had yeah, yeah. the context. I agree with that. And, I and I'm guessing that. that, okay, yeah, that's, and that's what it seemed like you were saying here. And I think, yeah, of course we could read something differently. So are you saying that maybe that was a bad choice of words when you asked that question or, or I don't know. I, think, I still think it's clear. I just, I do think you're being quite nitpicky, honestly, because I mean, okay. I, I was very clear. I mean, you know, just think about it. I didn't say that um, anyone, who, you know, that it's implausible to suppose that anyone who hates their brother thereby has killed somebody is responsible for murder. Right. I wasn't making that argument, was I? I didn't make that argument once. Yeah, I didn't I don't say it's here. right. So obviously, I just took that the word murderer doesn't get used in the kind of colloquial sense that I would use it as in everyday language, right? That there was some like hermeneutics or something that determines in this context what, what the word murderer means, right? I just granted that. I didn't even comment on it. It's just absolutely like none of my business what the wider meaning is of those non logical terms. That wasn't like relevant to what we were talking about so it just seems a bit weird to um think that when i was giving that example about taking the pages of surrounding pages away and then how you would read the sentence that remained that i would all of a sudden be talking back in those terms again like i would be on the same level of saying well your murderer means murderer it doesn't mean anything else like i, d I just feels like a, a, a strange way of understanding what i was saying i was at pains i may have been I may have like failed at this task, but I was at pains to explain what I was talking about was how you would go about determining what the logical form of the sentence was. After all, John's contention was that the way the logical form should be read wasn't as two conditionals. Well, but it was as two conditions, but also with a third premise that was hidden. So we had a dispute about what the logical form was. And so what we were talking about is how do you determine what the logical form is? So it just seems a bit of a weird way of reading what I was saying, that all of a sudden I was now talking about like determining the kind of meaning of the non-logical terms. Like I don't understand why you would like <laughs> why you would understand what I was saying then to have suddenly sort of switched back. I thought it was well, like, clear given the context. To be fair, it's not just me that understood it that way. There was even atheists that thought you were saying the same thing. So, I believe um, that Joshua tried to explain this to you yesterday for quite a while about the logical form. <laughs> Um, he explained so, this to him well, many times. Many, many times. Just, times yes, I mean, look, we, we right. have another atheist on stage who doesn't matter. You can philosophy. have ten thousand atheists, actually, and you can have Buddhists who actually really felt the exact same. Yeah, he actually exact, felt the you exact same my mother thing from as I did. The dead. It doesn't matter. Well, maybe I can't. Have, if you're just going to keep rambling, what I'm saying is we I'm have another rambling. atheist you're on speaking stage over me. who brought up. Okay, we well, look. Yeah, you over you over talked to me, Matt. Stop juggernauty. I think it was a. I think it was a bad. I think it was an unfortunate set of statements that led to some unclear conclusions. That's all I'm saying. And Same then, um, I do and agree. Then, well, hold on. Finish. I'm almost finished here. If you look at the transcript, you don't think this is crazy. Like that's not how you understand the logical form of the senses. The problem is. You could have put hermeneutics just didn't get and come up in the transcript. So I can mm. say, okay, yeah, because of that, maybe it's saying hermeneutic, this hermeneutics is crazy. It was just left out of transcript. So when I didn't hear this, it, you know, there was some confusion there. I admit that due to the unclarity of his mic breaking up and mic the bad up. transcript, it did break up. I still didn't Everyone hear it. Else heard it. That's a fault of yours. There was, a, there was someone else who just said they couldn't hear it on their You're own You're so computer. dishonest. There was literally someone else in the room who said they didn't that's, hear it. Yeah, and that's a fault of theirs. Okay, well, look, maybe it's my fault. You were also talking over it half the time. I wasn't when I was listening yes, to it privately was. and reading reading the transcript. I wasn't. So I think... Just was now just when it was played to you... You were. You talked no, over about two or three I times. I repeated it several times. I still didn't hear it. But because you were talking we over it. From that. I'm, I'm, conceding, I'm conceding the point. Um, but what I'm saying is it was an unfortunate set of statements that kind of led to people concluding things differently. And then to go on and start talking about the bank and saying, well, you, the bank wouldn't let you do that. And you're thinking, okay, well, look, you're dealing with banks. There's always fine print, stuff like that as well. So I just think the whole thing was, it seemed like you guys were so desperate to try to make John Lee look bad 
And I think that you put out Alex Malpass kind of on the spot here. And then when it was all said and done, if all Alex Malpass is saying is you just have to be true to the logical form of the statement, then that doesn't do anything to uproot anything else. But we were told the next morning that this shows how dishonest and inconsistent Christians are. And the next Don't, morning, people look, were celebrating the, this. And that's where all the confusion. And then that's when Sully got involved in the conversation. That's when I got involved in the conversation. And maybe well, it Sully, led if he wants to voice his objection, he can. But it seems like we're wrapping it up with you. Do you have any other, yeah, log no, do you have any other have logical else. objections? No, I'm good. Okay, do you we retract your... I want to... Let me just really quick. Let me just wrap it up with Matt Adams, please. Hang on a second. Just, okay, you don't have any other logical objections. <clears throat> do you retract the statement, quote, Alex Malpass is a Fisher-Price philosopher, end quote? <laughs> yes, I retract that statement. Based okay, on thank you very much. You can now go on based mute. Based on now you can go on he mute. had mic issues, yeah. He did Crash not have any mic issues. Well, he did. He admitted that. No, we, he can speculated he did, no, he and didn't. that was he speculated that might be a reason why you didn't hear well, it, look, and then okay. we listened to the recording there's, and there he was heard some it. sort of technical. There's some technical issues. There's there. no Due technical, technical difficulties. Issues, no, there's yes, none. I still haven't heard it. He really That's likes to double point. down. Yeah, me, but maybe. anyway, anyway, you guys can move on to Sully because Sully reached the same conclusion I did, so you can talk to Sully about that. Or a similar on my computer, I hear it. On, on my computer, I hear it the same way that he that he claims that it sounds. I think it's because of some weird setting that our computer might not common. have headphones but or look, something. Look, look, I'm gonna put yeah, it. But, but look, 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 hey, hey, hold on. I'm putting. <laughs> I'll, I can settle this. In the room chat, I have a time-stamped link to the video. You can play it on your own computer with your headphones, and you can hear it clear as day. He says this. That should settle it. it. Go listen to it, yeah, and but, if you don't but, hear it that way, then you can come back. But go listen to it first. I'm not, not gonna dis I'm not disagreeing with you. What I was, I was going to try to support what you were saying. On my computer, it sounds like he says that it sounds, but anyone... You also have problems with your connection right now, or is it just me? Yeah, and I know you're on a laptop, mm -hmm. too. Don't you yeah, use your come... laptop speakers, too? He's cutting it out. Yeah, you're cutting I'm out. Cutting so it. you you wonder why you're hearing things incorrectly, maybe. <laughs> and yes, he draws the word "this" out a little bit longer than a, than normally. That's maybe what they're they're missing. But it's clear as day that it's there. I mean, it, it, I can't believe we're arguing over the word "this." This is ridiculous. Hey, Look, there's the timestamp. Go listen to it. Let's move on. It's been settled. <laughs> yes, thank you. I was trying to agree with you. <laughs> Dan, were you saying that it sounded different on your on your laptop? It sounds different, yeah. but I don't think anyone should take it different. I, I think that yeah, right. it's exactly. obvious what we're saying. And, and the only reason why someone would take it differently is is that they're deliberately trying to misunderstand you. Well, you could you could That's look right. at the other passages where Alex <laughs> talks in in other epistles, and you could come to a completely opposite interpretation. <laughs> But I actually do exactly. think that it would help in that context to um, listen oh. to the other things I said. I mean, I think that's perfectly reasonable. Um, what, you know, is it more likely that I was pivoting to offer a, you know, uh, a critique of the field of hermeneutics? Or okay. was I saying that this guy's hermeneutics seemed wrong? I mean, which one of those two seems more likely, given what the other things I said? Right, I and now... That is relevant, right? Just just because I want to just be like thorough about this, I've asked Matt about his objections. He's in agreement. He's retracted his Fisher Price philosopher comment. That's great. He's retracted that there is an error in the in the logic of the argument. That's great. Um, now, Matt Adams, you elected champion Sully. Now, I want to be very clear, Matt, Sully is keep being given the option as he was before he can now voice whatever objection he has now you absolutely are witnessing me give your champion sully the chance to voice his objection sully you can take it or leave it yeah i mean uh, i don't really want to be mass champion here i had i had one issue because <laughs> i had originally 
I had originally only heard a small excerpt of the conversation, and Alex has, Alex has kind of addressed most of what I took issue with there um, today and actually at the end of the original video as well. Um, the only thing I wanted to ask you, though, um, on, on logical form, um, you're just saying it's sort of the syntactical grammatical structure that, that gives you that logical. So the only, the only sort of remaining concern I have here is just if, if you're looking at conditionals in natural language, does it, um, does it make sense to call them the logical form of, say, like a material conditional if you don't know for sure that that's what the person intended? since uh, natural language conditionals can be taken in other ways? Well, yeah, I think so. Like I said, I don't know if you were around earlier at the beginning of this conversation, but um, in, in the discussion with John the other day, I did sort of fall into the idiom of saying that the, the way to pass a logical format was as two conditionals. And that's like not completely wrong it's not completely misleading to say that it's not like i thought it had like a completely different logical form but um that would that's like using the language of propositional logic to, to express it but it actually seems to me a more accurate passing would re requires um quantify quantification and that means something like first order logic instead of propositional logic and i'm sorry if this i don't mean to say i'm not trying to talk over you i have no idea who you are or what background you've got so if, Tell me if, if what I'm He's saying is pretty savvy. He, I think he understands what you're saying. Yeah, no, I understand. Okay, cool. So, so basically, you know, a, a first gloss kind of thing in propositional logic would be okay, but but really, you you know, you're ignoring meaningful logical vocabulary if you if you left it that, at that, and you know, it it fits quite neatly into the categorical syllogism, like the the second figure of the first form. I think is. Um, modus celerant right which is uh basically all a's are b no b's are c therefore no a's are c right that that's pretty pretty much what i think is going on in that um in that argument and interestingly that doesn't actually involve a conditional at all and like it's it's not straightforwardly a conditional to say all a's are b right it it, it kind of is closely right. related to saying everything is such that if it's a then it's b Right. That's, so that would involve a conditional, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. So I'm not like hard selling um, a material conditional on you, but I, I think I'm pointing out like a basic um, sort of datum that any logical analysis, whether it involves a material conditional or not, would have to have to like contend with. And there's only going to be a limited range of plausible looking candidates. Like you can't say the logical form of that sentence is a and b and c and d and e and f right that's not a plausible reading of what's going on there um but i guess you're right you know there's there are questions in that like what's the if then construction what's the best way of rendering that in in formal logic is it like an indicative conditional is it a subjunctive conditional etc cetera, etc cetera. i'm not saying i know the answer to all those questions right the philosophy of logic is super interesting i'm not trying to say i know everything about it but you know it it it's not like radically different from what I was saying. It's going to be very close to that, right? I mean, it's not difficult to say yeah. because the sentence is so straightforward. It says, "If everyone who hates his brother is a murderer," it's not even really a borderline case of one way you might think it has different logical forms. Like it's obviously there's this class of things haters and a class of things um, murderers. Right? And it's just saying that one of those classes contains the other one. Like, however you exactly cash that out in logic right. is up to you. But like the set theory even is like completely transparent. I don't think anyone would argue about that. And I don't know if I could explain it completely. I, I'm not even sure there is a completely 100% watertight theory of like how you translate English sentences into logical form. And in fact, there actually isn't. There definitely isn't. But um, it's not by reading surrounding passages. I mean, that's... I've been around, right? I've seen lots of different philosophy of logic stuff. Like n nobody thinks that that's not right. a view on the table. So um, it was a it was a sort of strange proposition to be to be given. Then. And I expressed that by saying this hermeneutics is crazy, but I think I just overstepped. What I, sh I just shouldn't have used the word hermeneutics, right? Because that just saying hermeneutics to a bunch of like Bible 
you know, analyzers and theorists or whatever is gonna, is like um, a red rag to a bull. And it's just unfortunate on my part. I should have just said this analysis is crazy. And then I think nobody would have, nobody would have got confused about what I meant there. So anyway, hopefully that yeah. explains Could, it. Can I maybe ask you like one sort of follow-up on that? Of course, yeah, yeah. So I went, I went back and I read like just this chapter that this verse came out of, not like the other epistles or anything like that, but just like the full chapter of the verse. And okay. I think Jack had pointed out earlier that, you know, it's basically written in the form of a speech. And I do, I do think you're correct in saying that it's kind of structured in this sort of Aristotelian syllogism. And that's probably intended, but I do think, so, so the form, I think you're correct on there with respect to this uh, verse. Um, but in the context, it's basically, you know, it's writing to people who he's saying are saved and it's exhorting them not to hate each other. You know, it's basically like a call to action, like you should mm -hmm. take this as seriously as murder and so on. So um, while the form might be syllogistic, I'm not sure that it's, it's meant to be, you know, uh, strictly, um, you know, a, a, a rational inference that this is the conclusion, whereas it's more a rhetorical device in the speech. Um, and I was thinking of this like with respect to like, A Tale of Two Cities when he opens with, uh, it was the best of times, it was the worst, it was the worst of, times. of times. Yeah. And you, you could think that's just a, a contradiction like in form, um, but I don't think Dickens intends it to just be taken as a contradiction, if that makes sense. No, but Dickens, the, the disambiguation is he's straightforward, right? In some respects, it's the best of times, right? Like business is booming and like, you know, grad grinds uh, enterprise is going well, but also it's the worst of times because of all the like poverty and like inequality and stuff that comes up with it. Like it's obvious how to disambiguate that, right? And it's fine if you want to say um, the way out of this conundrum is a similar disambiguation, um, right? So that there's some sense of murder in the first premise, another one in the second, and they're not the same. And that's how you get around the issue. But I, I, unless that's what you're saying, I don't really understand what the relevance is. And, and that seems like one of the escape routes we looked at. And the problem with that is it's just, that's what equivocation is. <laughs> that's the definition of an equivocation fallacy in an argument. It's using the same term in the premises like that, like it's the middle term in the syllogism. But if you don't mean the same thing in premise one as in premise two, it doesn't actually join the, the, the classes together. There's basically four classes and it's not clear what the logical relation is rather than three. Um, so it just completely ruins the, um, well, it just leaves, it, it disrupts the logical form to the point where we don't really know what it's saying, right? It's like, right, does it, so are you saying that? I mean, are you I saying mean, it's, it's some disambiguation that would get you out of the, look, the I, bind? Look, let me, maybe I can help because I saw what you wrote in the chat, Sully, and it was something like, you know, uh, an analogy where a bank robber goes to the bank and he like hands over a note, which is just like, you know, the moon is this and just like completely divorced from any kind of like hand over the money, just like just gibberish, right? So that seems to be right, what right. you're saying is so something like, hey, what if in this passage, it seems like it's weird, but what if he's really saying something like pick up some milk on the way home? And so, and then you're gonna say something like, well, the passage could even say A and not A <clears throat> at the same time in the same way in the same place, but it means something different. But I think Alex just got to just simply say, why should I interpret it like that? Well, I mean, the bigger right, issue right, Alex right. is bringing up, though, I think, and Alex, correct me if I'm wrong, is that, look, even if he wants to say that that's what they're doing, is like they're interpreting in some whatever way, they're still going to say that the two meanings are going to be different when they use it on both sides of that, right? And he's just saying, well, that's just straightforwardly equivocating then. If you, well, that's what you're trying to say to get out of the problems by saying that just one of those murders is different and it's going to be interpreted completely differently than the other murder. And it's not yeah, yeah. It's like logical. saying, It's like saying, oh, don't worry, it looks like a syllogism. If it was, we'd be in trouble. But don't worry, guys, it's not. It's just that the author of John equivocated, right? So there's a, there's a kind of fallacy uh, written into that verse of John. 
And like, you can say that if you want, you could just say, look, John just misspoke. He didn't, he just forgot to write the third premise in. That's mm -hmm. another version of the same thing. But both of those in, imply that John like made a mistake, right? So, and it's really hard to square that with the idea that the Bible doesn't have fallacies and falsehoods and stuff in it. It's not like, like Aristotle's notes or something where we don't really know where the mistakes start and where they stop. You want to say there's no mistakes. So um, if he's equivocating and he's <laughs> giving a fallacious argument, right? Uh, but how, how come, right? Oh, how yeah, come no, I, the infallible I agree. I, has this fallacious argument. So I, I'm, not a, I'm not a Christian, uh, just, just to be clear. <laughs> but I mean, I, I'm not saying I... Way. Yeah, basically. I'm, I don't think that... I'm saying that uh, I, I want it to be taken equivocally. Like I'm saying that in the context of the speech, it it is that syllogism that you spelled out. Um, I'm just saying that it's an illustrative device or like a rhetorical device that basically the, the meaning of it is you should be taking hating your brother as seriously as you take murder. Um, sure. And, okay. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's the clear, like, um, wider significance of the passage or whatever. Like, I, I, I mean, it's, it's not difficult to kind of crack the code and work out what he might be saying, right? Like, don't don't hate each other, fellow Christians, blah, blah, blah. And you should treat that as like a really bad thing you shouldn't do. Completely understand that that's, I'm not disputing that that's the kind of meaning of the phrase or something. Um, it obviously is. Um, it's just that, uh, well, the clear, yeah. I mean, if that's what you're saying, then I mean, there's a whole there's a whole host of like issues about that. This is the whole point of the original argument was um, that if you're a Calvinist, right, then that advice like doesn't really make sense anymore. And this is this is what the original discussion was about because someone who is in like John's position, he took himself to know that he had um, that he was saved. Um, there's no way he can actually. Uh, do anything that, that um, poses yeah. a threat to his salvation or something. Uh, but this passage is saying that there is something you can do that poses a threat to your salvation, specifically if you're a Christian. And it's just really difficult for someone um, to reconcile that. So, I mean, I, I think I just completely agree that um, that's the meaning of the phrase, kind of wider context. And that, and that in itself causes problems for how you're supposed to understand that. But at least, I haven't really thought it through for all of the other denominations, but problem for a Calvinist seems quite glaring, I think. So yeah, I mean, I just think this, <laughs> what's fun about this is that there's no obvious way, no obvious thread to pull on that doesn't have some kind of awkward consequence. Mm -hmm. That's what's interesting about it. And it's not like a knockout blow. It doesn't mean Christianity's false or anything like that. It's just... Um, right, and so an another interpretation is brother... And this was even forwarded by the Christians, like that it's it can't be inter the interpretation of brother can't be a Christian. Like if two people are brothers, it can't the, the interpretation of brother can't be two Christians. Because okay. if a Christian can't hate one another, then that it's it makes no sense. It's nonsense. But then if they if they choose that, the thread is now the passage is nonsense, right? It's you now if you take that interpretation, then uh, you might have escaped uh, some kind of analysis by the atheist of of their interpretation of brother, like a, a prospective Christian or someone who identifies as Christian. But now you've made the, the passage nonsense. Why is it nonsense then? Because if it means um, like brother as in say sibling or something. Oh, no, 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 not that one. The one where they're both Christians. Because if, if their Christian is going to say that a Christian can't hate another brother, and this passage is saying when this Christian hates another brother, well, that's something that can't happen according to the Christian. On the unconditional salvation view, like you can never lose your salvation. Oh, right, right, right. Right. Yeah, I guess I took so it to mean that like yeah. Christians just physically can't hate each other. Right, and that's that's kind of the absurdity of it. It's it's not so much that they're yeah. not Christian or something. I, I don't know. Maybe I right. think there's lots of well, different ways of kind of rearranging the propositions. But I kind of had this vision of somebody like, you know, in a come out of church and they're like trying to drive their car out of the car park, and then someone pulls out from their space and like, you know, hits their car and like ruins the bumper or something, and then and then drives off without like letting you exchange insurance details, right? 
So you're obviously two Christians because you've both just come out of church, but one of one of them's just rear-ended you and then driven off. Um, and you'd obviously like, I mean, natural, the most natural thing in the world would be to like get annoyed then. Like what a prick, you just rear-ended me and drove off. Um, but that's what this passage, if it's read like that, would be saying like it somehow is like impossible. Like you can't, you can't yeah. actually hate that person. Like, if you're a Christian and he's a Christian and you're both saved and that happens, Someone, so what is it saying that like you wouldn't have that emotion like you just wouldn't right. hate them or something it's I like the, the, really guy, the guy sees the hit and run driver driving off sque t tires squealing and mm. he raises up his hand and he's he's like trying to flip him off but like somehow with his like a force fee he can't do it he's like, a why, physical impossibility why can't i right, this, right. I... well but even worse tom was that matt interpreted brother to mean other human Right. Where that so broadens view, the scope even more. Yeah. It's, and he thinks yeah. that gets him out of trouble. And I think that just makes the pot very, very big. Um, so it's that it's impossible for Christians to hate or murder anyone. Yeah. yeah. Alex, what do you think about a relative term like uh, abiding that's used in that passage? Because like, I, I see it as like uh, conditional. I mean, I agree with you about John's um, the argument you're laying out with John, but like, the abiding in um so like eternal life abides within him or something uh well the, that the language is is used there as like of like what christians look at is like the 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 holy spirit is like trying to lead somebody in a direction and like there's these passages that are like uh and, and if you don't listen right you're not going to be led down the right like you know path basically you'll end down your self-destructive path or whatever right um now, do you think that, like, you, you, you agree there could be a significance there? Because the conclusion, the conclusion wouldn't be, therefore, non-Christian, right? It would be, like, something like um, continuing in, in, in the, the path or something. Um, so the, the phrase, as, as I read it on my phone, says, um, no murderer has eternal life abiding in him, right? And... What he's saying that the what the the idea is that I mean because I was taking that to just mean um, is saved right or goes to heaven or something. Right. That's all that eternal uh, life right. abiding in him means. But I don't know if yeah. it's supposed to mean that there's some, you know the Holy Ghost is kind of holding his hand and leading him in the right direction or something like that. I I don't know. I'd never really thought about that. But um, I. It just doesn't, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe is that how I should understand the phrase has eternal life abiding in him rather than I, just finding out like that they're saved? Um, I would take, I would take it that way. Yeah, just, just because like if you read Romans 2 and I can give you, I don't want to bore the audience, but basically, um, yeah, I take the language of abiding is always used with either the indwelling of, of it'll say like Christ's spirit or of God's spirit or the Holy Spirit, right? The abiding does language. Does that mean... Does that mean something different than being saved? Going to heaven? Yeah. Type well, being part yeah, of the it'll event. Be like, yeah, because there's a passage that says that you can grieve. It says don't grieve the spirit as if it wouldn't leave you if you did grieve it. And then there's a distinction between sins that lead to death and sins that, that don't. And so I'm thinking that the, the issue here is like the murdering is like one of those sins that like if you like have this continual like hate for a brother or something like that, then it's like you can deduce that, um, you know, that you had, like, you know, lost the, the spirit convicting you, right? You get what I mean by that? I, I mean, I don't think mm. Alex is, like, super commuted to any particular interpretation. I think with the eternal life thing, that was just the terminology that John wanted to use, and so he did. Yeah, I think that's right. I think, I, I don't remember John ever saying, oh, you shouldn't read it as meaning that you have eternal life or something. In fact, I think he said yeah, a couple of times something yeah. like, um, you know, actually the correct term is eternal life or something. Right. Whereas yep. I was saying that's one right. of the elect or something. So, uh -huh. I mean, I don't think it was going, I don't think that's a point of dispute or in the moment than last week. Um, no, I totally agree. You nailed it. Yeah, but a Christian is defined as one who has eternal life abiding in them, right? Uh, are you asking me? I think he's actually. No, what do you know? You don't know anything. <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I, yeah, I just take it as like a, yeah. The abiding is like a continuing in the faith kind of thing. It's like you, the spirit is like this, you know, thing that God 
guides you with. And if you ignore it, as Romans two says, like they'll, he'll like hand you over to like your own selfless or your own selfish like desires. And you'll follow that path instead of the path, the true path. Yeah, okay, right. so I think this is probably now I'm thinking about it a little bit. I, I think it just is again, another kind of repackaging of the same logical structure, because I mean, suppose like it doesn't just mean, um, that you go to heaven, but what it means is, um, I don't know, something like, you know, the Holy Ghost is kind of with you or, or whatever. And being with you doesn't mean you're going to go to heaven. Like it just kind of helps you or something. But if it's not with you, then you're not going to go to heaven. Like you, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition for going to heaven, I think is what the idea is supposed to be. But then that just sounds exactly the same, that it's playing the same role um, of the idea John had for the um, hidden premise, which was just like, yeah, it, you, know, you if you're a murderer, you're not going to go to heaven. Um, unless you get saved, right? So then it's like this um, condition that like can overrule whether or not the murder has any significance for your soteriology or something. So like maybe the Holy Ghost comes back and embraces you later or something. But if he doesn't, then you're not. Well, so it sort of like pushes the Holy Ghost away or something. But maybe he can forgive you later on if you if you're lucky and still go to heaven, even if you're a murderer. Well, I mean, it's yeah, playing that type of role. It's the same though. thing. Yeah, I think it would be the, but well, I just think we've just, like I said before, like moving the deck chairs around, it's just the same, we've just re-described yeah, yeah. the same thing. So, yeah. Well, it's like conditional language, right? But on John's view, John doesn't accept the conditional kind of view, right? So it's just going to follow for him. But, uh, but yeah, the continuing language or the abiding in language, right? It, it makes it like not a strict deduction, I guess. Or do you disagree with that? So like, I think we would just distinguish between, you know, um, what's, so the, 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 the term, the C, the kind of minor term in this syllogism, right? Which is the um, having eternal life abiding in you. Um, if it either means straightforwardly that uh, you're going to heaven and that's it. So it's just like in John's case from I was talking to him the other day, he was saying effectively that because he was like predestined to be in heaven, doesn't actually matter uh, anything. N no, no action of his can have consequences for his salvation because it's a done deal before he does any action. So like, obviously there's no way he could qualify as a murderer in the sense that would have consequences for his salvation um, and that that's what that premise was about but if it means something weaker than um, any murderer won't go to heaven if it means something like any murderer um, will be you know perhaps temporarily abandoned by the holy spirit right but it could come back later or something um, then I guess the analysis would just be that it would fall on that horn where premise two just looks false kind of thing. Because if you say anyone who's a murderer won't go to heaven, it's false because you could be a murderer who later on um, gets like accepted by the Holy Spirit again or something like, because he could come back. So that premise just look, kind of looks false. It's kind of like saying anyone who's in this condition won't be in the other condition. But you're, if you're saying it's just about this temporary perhaps, abandonment of the Holy Spirit that was guiding you but might come back, then it's false to say, it's, it's basically saying that the, the Holy Spirit won't come back, but if he might do, then it's false to say that he won't come back. You see what I mean? So I think we just sort of land on on that horn again. I think that's why I was saying we've just re-described the situation, but on either, in either case, what we've got is it's still going to be one disambiguation makes premise one false and the other one makes premise two false. I might not be explaining it as clearly as I did last time around, but that strikes me as as what's going on there. Does that make sense? Maybe it doesn't. I might be no, yeah, no, it does. Okay. It's, okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, it does. I, 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 John, it, John, if you're there, do you have any questions you want to ask? I want to make sure all these people that had objections get a chance to ask a question if they're there. And then maybe we can kind of conclude. I, well, it says that he's idle, so um, maybe he'll come back. But Alex, if you don't mind, um, do you, 
I I know you remember your conversation with Matt Slick from years ago. Or, uh, excuse yeah, me, I had conversations. two conversations. Yeah, conversations. Yeah, two, I think. Um, and those are still referenced every once in a while to this day. We were talking about it. And because of... Um, because you appeared last week and you talked to John, people were talking about you, and uh, Darth Dawkins uh, was talking about you, and he was doing a critique of your critique of Matt Slick. Okay. Um, and see, it lasts for about three and a half minutes, so I was wondering if I could play it for you, and then you could tell me if it's a valid critique or what you thought about it. Would you mind doing yeah. that? Why not? Okay, here we go. Hang on a second. And please, no one speak while I'm playing as in my echo. Acted with Alex Mouth passed about eight. Come up with is just say, oh, I just think all gods are made up. That was it. That was the substance. Of what he of what he had to say. Okay, now he should know better. That's that's the genetic fallacy. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take for example when he critiqued Matt Slick's syllogism, and he misrepresented what Matt was semantically conveying by trying to represent it in symbolic language, and he he bastardized what Matt was saying. So what Matt said, either it's the case that God. Um, can provide the basis of intelligibility, or the not God world provides for the basis of intelligibility, and that Matt said um, not not God, therefore God. So Matt, so Malpass came in, and actually misrepresented what 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 uh, Matt was saying because I listened to that very very carefully, and then I approached Matt Slick and I said, "Did you mean this or that?" And I'll explain to you what he meant. When Matt said, not, not God, okay, he was not negating not God as not existing. What he was saying is the not God realm doesn't have the identifiable defensible characteristics to provide for intelligibility. But Alex Malpass was re representing it in terms of symbolic lo logic that he was saying not, not God, which would equal God. And Alex wasn't operating under the principle of charity. Alex, having a PhD in philosophy and being thoroughly trained in symbolic lo logic, can, can know that not not God can have one more than one semantic meaning. Not not God can either mean God, or it could mean the not God realm cannot do X. Now, how did he miss that basic distinction there in semantics. How'd that happen? I asked, I asked Matt Slick, when you said not, not God, did you mean that not, not God means God? And he said, no. I said, did you mean that not, not God meant that whatever the not God world would be constitutive of is that it does not have the identifiable defensible capabilities to ground intelligibility? He goes, yeah, that's what I meant. But, but that's but not Carl, how that's, do you understand not not God if not God? You're saying no, because, be, because be, well, okay, let me let me illustrate it for you. Okay, last November I had to get a, a you know my battery uh, you know lost its charge, and so I said you know I'll just get a new battery. I don't want to. So I called AAA. They came out and they replaced it after he installed the battery. I said, "What's the charge on the battery?" And he, he then proceeded to tell me what the cost of it would be, and I said, "Oh no." I meant, what's the voltage on the battery? Okay? Not, not God, semantically can mean two different things. Okay? Matt was just uh, expressing himself. Yeah. Matt was simply expressing himself in a slightly inartful way, which anybody can do. And I asked Matt Slick, okay? When you say not, not God, are you saying the not God world doesn't exist in that part of the syllogism? Or did you mean that the not God realm doesn't have, isn't identifiable and defensible as having the characteristics yeah. that can ground it? And he said, yeah, that's what I meant. 
So Ma but Alex I Malpass constructed a straw man. And that's the clip. Um, it's, that? it's interesting. So I was trying to look up um, the original blog post that I made where before I talked to him, I wrote out a little analysis of it. Um, and I give two, two links, I think, to him saying the argument in debates, one with Dan Barker and one with Matt Dillahunty and a clip from his podcast where he talks to someone who calls himself Hollywood Dude, where he gives the argument. Um, and then I also reference his website, um, Matt Slick's website called calm.org, where it's the transcendental argument. But just click on the website link just to see if I could pull up how he said it. And it looks like the link is broken. So maybe he's restructured his page or something, but that link doesn't work anymore. And I'm not going to just sit and listen to three podcast episodes or whatever it is to try and remember exactly how he said it. But I, I do think he said it quite similar to how I, how I characterize it. But anyway, um, so Dart's idea is that you could say, instead of it being um, like um, an, a logical negation, um, it's like he's saying either, so it's like we're splitting the world that, you know, everything that exists into two, um, sets or something, right? One is the God part of it, and the other bit is the not God part of it. So, like, the God part is a transcendent, omni benevolent mind that created the universe, etc. And the not God part of it is everything else, like the material world, whatever, the, you know, everything apart from God. Um, and Darth is saying the best way to construe what Matt was saying is that um, the first premise should be either the God part of the world explains or grounds or whatever it is, the laws of logic or the not God part does. And then, mm -hmm. then him saying it's not just, you know, the material world doesn't provide on its own the resources to ground the laws of logic. And therefore it must be um, the transcendent God part of the world that does, right. does that. Yeah. Yeah. So easy to see that understanding of what's going on. I don't think that's, a plausible reading of what Matt Slick was saying. I mean, I, I guess it kind of is, um, but I, who cares, right? Yeah, like, let's think, think about that argument on its own. What does it actually change, though, Alex? In any case, it's still going to be not. I think it changes. changes. No, 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 I no, think no, it I changes think. things. And so I'm getting quite a lot of echo from every now and again. Oh, again. Sorry, um, that's um, fine, thanks. So I think it does change things because the analysis on the way I was looking at it in the first place was that the argument's basically trivial because, like, premise two is just um, not not God, and that is the same as the conclusion. It's just a double negation elimination. It's just a one-step deduction. So you don't actually need the first premise at all. And anyway, the first premise, if read like that, is a tautology, right? So obviously any argument that works is also going to work if a tautology is added to it. So I get, I mean, like, the whole thing just seemed redundant on that, on the original reading. But if we read it the way Darth was suggesting, then I take it the first premise isn't a tautology anymore because um, the way I was understanding it was that like we're splitting up everything that kind of actually exists into two chunks and the, you know the God bit and the material bit. Um, but it's not clear to me that um, either of those ha has to provide uh, the resources to explain or ground the laws of logic. I mean, not it's not a tautology anyway to say that they do because unless someone can explain what's contradictory about it it could be that the laws of logic don't have any grounding and are just like not you know explained away by talking in other terms or something so the, the problem would just be what makes you think the first premise is true like why would it so i wouldn't be talking about a problem the validity of the argument in the sense that it was right. just trivial or something i would be saying what do you mean either the t oh, i suppose i would i would probably argue with the truth the truth of both the premises um why well, think you know what's the supporting argument to think that the laws of logic have groundings is you can run these kind of aristotelian ideas that like nothing can be the explanation of why something like the law of non-contradiction is true i mean i don't particularly like those arguments but there's a strong heritage of people who claim that the laws of logic don't have any the grounding to them or something and then you know you can run an aristotelian argument for that so i could sort of see uh, even launching a defense of that but i'm not really aware of anyone who argues that 
you might say that Aristotle's arguments aren't very good, but you wouldn't be able to rule out that hypothesis to like prove that the laws of logic have to be grounded or explained in terms of something else. I just, I don't understand. Okay, it's a so really weird claim. So let me try to yeah. understand you. You're saying that uh, he's not saying P accounts for logic or whatever. Or not. Or yeah, not, he's not, he's not doing yeah. that. He's actually saying something like either P or Q accounts for logic. And then there's guess, a couple yeah, of objections. Yeah. One is that it's not exhaustive, so that's not going to get to like you know some sort of deductive conclusion. And number two, it's possible that logic is not accounted for. Period. Right. Right. Yeah, that's true. It could be accounted for something that's not in that box, I suppose, or it could be just not accounted for anything at right, all. Right. Exactly. So there's that's two right. objections yeah. to that. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So it would be a question of soundness, and I mean, and let's not like pretend that there's much more going on because really all that's happening here is just um it's just i i, I mean if you ever heard the um greg Banson, uh what's the guy called stein george stein is it whatever the anyway the Banson stein debate right it's this sort of famous apologetics sort of ponage debate from i think the early 90s or maybe the 80s i don't know mm -hmm. if dan's still here he probably knows um when that was 80s or 90s anyway it was yeah, I don't remember. It was either 80s or 90s. Yeah, right, right. But in that, um, Stein is a kind of, um, like, I don't know, I suppose he's a bit like Richard Dawkins. He's kind of scientist dude. And um, it, I guess, you know, wasn't really re prepared for the kind of, like, ultra-philosophical um, way that Banson approached the debate. So Banson takes this kind of, like, hard line um, transcendental argument that I think Stein had just never heard before and didn't understand it. And as a consequence, because Stein's so out of his depth and such a like poor debater, um, Banson just walks all over him and absolutely destroys him. And I just think that that, um, and, and what goes on in that debate is that um, Banson basically says that like, he, 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 I, I can't remember the detail, but he, he very strongly runs together, it seems to me, the idea of being an atheist and being a kind of um, like churchman style reductive materialist, right? So that you have to, you, you can't admit anything other than just like atoms and things you can see right. with a test tube or something. Um, and that if is. If you can't is, show it, you can't know it. <laughs> right, right, right. As, exactly. So, so then, and then the thought is just well, look, if you take that sort of hardline materialist view, which he, I don't know if, Ban, if Stein actually does, but yeah, some people do, right? And, and some of those are atheists, right? Um, if you're in that boat, then, okay, what, what do you say about the laws of logic or, or th other abstract things like possible worlds or, I don't know, propositions, truth, beauty, whatever, love? You have to talk about these things that don't seem very tangible. And if you're only allowed the resources of kind of material descriptions of stuff, what are you going to do? Right? You've got, you've got, there's a challenge there. Um, but just simply pointing that there's a challenge doesn't in any way mean that the challenge is unmeetable or whatever. I, I, I'm, I'm not really inclined to those sorts of reductive materialist explanations of things, but I'm not, I'm not also thinking that there's no way in principle they could say anything about it. I mean, there's, there's a sort of school of the philosophy of logic, which is called conventionalism, right? Which is associated with people like David Hilbert, where, um, logic isn't imbued with any um, metaphysical significance whatsoever, right? There just is no, there's no such thing as the law of logic, like as an object that needs to be like accounted for or something. It's um, it, when we say things like referring to the laws of logic, they would say that's just shorthand for talking about an informal mm -hmm. bunch of like conventions and stuff that people have agreed upon. So dead one, I mean, I don't like conventionalism, but I, that somebody could say that. So all they've got really is like trying to reproduce the ponage of Banson and Stein on that one day, right. but that one atheist didn't know anything <laughs> about the philosophy of logic, didn't have anything to say. And as if that's it, there's nothing, there's no other debate, because all you have to do is say to an atheist, how do you account for logic? And they're going to be floundering around like that one dude was once on that YouTube video they heard. So that's Matt Slick's actual argument. He's just trying to replay that moment over and over. Like he wants to be Banson. Right. But... The argument is like really, really 
I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah, it's kind of offensively flawed. flawed yeah, <laughs> it's so bad. Because um, you know, you just don't have to be uh, a materialist at all if you're an atheist. Right? Those, those two things are just completely independent of each other. Um, and many know... atheists are not materialists or, or whatever. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. Do you know that to this day, he still hasn't come to grips with the fact that the argument is flawed so badly? Matt Slick. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know. I haven't listened to anything he said for like five years, so I have no idea. But I wouldn't be surprised if he was still saying the same sort of thing. Oh, he's just saying the same sort of thing. He's actually kind of not rendering the argument as frequently as he used to be but he still got it in his toolbox but yeah. he knows that there's there's these sort of criticisms floating about and we've brought it up to him i think here and there and he just kind of hand waves it and it's there's not really any substance to his rebuttal mm. um, but i mean i think it's kind of understandable that if you are, let's just put your, let's just imagine you're Matt Slick. You've been working on this for 40 years. This is like your like masterpiece of your career. This is like the keystone of your apologetics. And you make a living doing apologetics. You can see how someone would be emotionally tied to that sort of argument to the point where they would even like fool themselves or be unable to to handle that their little baby is flawed yeah i do think that i think i can imagine i think everybody's you know has the potential to um be like that i think i'm probably like that on a bunch of stuff oh, um, I think difficult to say it's a human thing it's like a human yeah. thing right yeah that's right but i also just think that he in particular is not um not well suited to doing logic like i don't think he picked it up quickly i think i've talked to i mean i used to teach logic to you know first year undergraduates and often in the uk anyway and i think in america too kind of school system obviously is not very good at preparing people to do things like math so yeah, they often just think they don't like maths and can't do it and lots of people when they choose to do philosophy they're they're picking a humanity subject and they think it's like reading hume and whatever Plato and stuff like that. And they don't think it's going to be maths. And then um, in Bristol uni where I taught, everybody has to do logic as in the first term of the first year and it's formal logic. So you're proving theorems and propositional logic and stuff. So I would look, talk to lots of people and was trying to explain, here's what we mean, blah, blah, blah. And lots of them didn't get it. Some of them did quickly. Some of them would take, you know, most of the semester before they would pick up what was going on and be able to pass the test or something. But like, so I've talked to lots of people who are in that early stages of like, what is logic? How does this work and stuff? I think mm -hmm. I can tell reasonably well when people are going to pick it up and when they're not. And, and these days right. I do, I, I, you know, do computer coding and stuff and software and whatnot and talk to people about coding and help them learn how to do that sometimes too. And the same thing, you just, sometimes people just pick it up quickly and sometimes people just find it really difficult to understand what you mean. I think just Matt is just one of those people who's not, his brain doesn't like be the logical form quickly, doesn't, in, doesn't work in the same way for him. It's almost like a kind of dyslexia. I think people can have dyslexia for, for numbers or something. I mean, and right. maybe he's got something like that. He's, I don't know, it's, you know, it's dyslexia, but it's, it's not his forte, definitely. Um, right. I wouldn't be surprised if he still didn't really get it because I just think his brain doesn't work like that. And I, think he can I think a perfect example of that is the last time I actually spoke with him is that I, I, you know, he seemed to agree that it could be trivial. And his response was, so what? <laughs> it doesn't mean it's not true, I think was his next sentence yeah. that he said. Yeah, well, Alex, you're not, just to be clear, you're saying that the way Darth represented it, it's still not a true dichotomy. It, well, it was a true dichotomy under Matt Slick. The first premise was a, was a tautology, mm -hmm. but on, the way Darth put it, it seemed to me right. anyway, one reading of that was that like you take the the actual world, everything that exists, everything that actually exists, and you kind mm -hmm. of carve it up into the mm -hmm. bits that are God and the bits that are not God. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. you ask of each of those two sub regions whether they could account 
for the laws of logic or something. I mean, I suppose, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's, I, I, yet another way that's that the presuming premise... that something accounts for the laws of logic, right? Because right, like right, the true right. dichotomy exactly. would be either God accounts for the laws of logic or it is not the case that God accounts for the laws of logic. And yeah. that would include the possibility that nothing accounts for the laws of logic, right? Because it's just not the case that God accounts for the laws of logic. Yeah, so the, the, the way to put the tautology was, uh, sorry, I, maybe I missed, did you say, say it like this? So either it's the case that God accounts for the laws of logic or it's not the case that God accounts for the laws of Correct. logic. Correct, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So putting it like that, it's just exactly everything other than God accounting for the laws of logic is in the other mm -hmm. side of the bracket. But when I say everything other, I mean the whole of logical space is right. in the other side of the category, right? So right. Right. when Darth is talking, the way I understood that clip that we were played, he was talking yeah. about everything that like exists in terms of like the actual world, the concrete things, the planets, the stars, mm -hmm. whatever, and God, right, as well, just mm -hmm. assuming that he is part of the actual world. And that one mm -hmm. of those, you know, if we, that one of those two subregions is the thing that grounds the laws of logic or something. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yeah, as you said, it it's also like asking when you stopped being your wife or whatever, because it right. assumes that something right. did. That's something. True. Also, yeah. it's true that, um, it might be, you know, because because what if nothing does? That's what I was saying in the first place. Like maybe right, you have this right. Aristotelian idea that nothing grounds the laws of logic or something. But I mean, yeah, maybe I mean, something does, and it's not um, contained within the the set of things that we chopped in half in the first place. Because mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. plausibly, you might think there's something other than the material world and God. Even if you're a Christian, you might that's, be a Platonist yeah. or something, right? So right. you might think that there are other things that exist. They're just not like part of the actual world in the same way. Um, and then, Alex, I, I, unless I'm misunderstanding what Darth's saying, I, I don't think he's changing the first premise so much in the way that, that you're saying. I could be wrong, but I, I think he's saying either on, on one side, God accounts for the, the what he's intelligibility, the, or the intelligibility yeah, mm -hmm. of, of everything, or there's a world where God doesn't exist that nothing accounts for the laws of intelligibility. Well, I'm, I mean, so what you've done is introduced this idea of um, relativizing the truth of this to different worlds or something, but like, it seems to me that it's probably right, yeah. it would be weird to think that he's saying it's contingent what grounds the laws of logic, yeah. that it would be different across different worlds. So I'd imagine if it's true in this world, it's got to be true in, it's like a necessary truth if it's true at all. Something grounds the laws of yeah. logic. So I mean, I, he's got to have that... some like hidden premise that something grounds logic. Right, exactly. So, and then and something but, accounts you know, for logic. Either right. God accounts for logic or not God. Or the material for... world. This is a, yeah, yeah. The, it either means either God accounts yeah, for or, logic. Yeah, or the material, or the material world, world accounts for logic. Yeah. yeah. And, and mm -hmm. spelled spell out like that, the, the fact that it's not a dichotomy is more obvious, right? right? There's, right. there, could, there could be more than just material or God. There could be a third thing, right? Like a, mm -hmm. a platonic object or something. And, and because it's not a true, head. yeah, and because it's not a true dichotomy, you can't use like Matt's trying to do just by negating the second part of the disjunct in a true dichotomy, then you're just saying the first, no, no, the first is true, right? It's still okay to use, the first premise could just be a disjunction, either A or B not A, therefore B, that's completely fine. It doesn't have to be that the first premise is a dichotomy, which is like A or not A, right? Like there's a tautology like that. So it could be that the first premise is um, true, but without being a tautology, and that the argument would still be valid. My point would just be, yes. why yes. think that first premise yeah. is true, right? What's the argument for that? Um, and, and I think, yeah, it's quite right to say, what he really means is actually that there's an additional premise, which is that mm -hmm. um, something explains or grounds the laws of logic. And I think supporting that argument means having an argument, having a fight with those Aristotelians who strongly think they can argue for the idea that nothing supports the laws of logic, right? Um, and even if you win that argument, you've still then got to, to and have an argument now with the Platonists about like, well, say something grounds the laws of logic. It has to either be material or divine and they're going to say no it could be a third thing right an abstract object it could be kind of platonic account of what logical oh, yeah maybe i misunderstood what matt i thought matt was trying to use the feature of a true dichotomy being a tautology 
use that to ground his I think he was at first, and then he was kind of like trying to fix it and stuff. Yeah, the benefit for him of the first premise being a tautology is that you have to accept Mm -hmm. that it's true. Right, right, right. Right. That's the only reason he was doing that. It's not because it works better with the second premise or something. It's just that he doesn't have to. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. but the problem is if it's a tautology, then it's because the, you know then it's trivial, right? Right, right. because it doesn't matter, it doesn't play any but role. But he doesn't understand what game. trivial means. No, I think right. that's right. Yeah, he thinks it just it, means like, oh, well, it's easy or something <laughs> like. Yeah, so I think he has a background in apologetics, right? I think he studied at the what's it, the Westminster um, Theological Seminary, mm-hmm. but not the one in. Um, Philadelphia, the one in California, which I, I think was set up later anyway. And I think he's got a master's degree. I don't think he's got like a, he's got a master's in divinity. Yeah. Okay. So th- I doubt that had any logic in it at all. Certainly no formal logic. Do you he know hasn't that done he, formal logic. So. Would you be surprised to learn that he offers on the karm.org website, a paid course on logic? I'm not surprised, um, but <laughs> You probably won't be surprised either if I say that's that's probably not actually a course on, well, it's not actually a course on formal logic. I guess it doesn't say that. He might mean like reasoning and fallacies and stuff like that. That's what he's trying to say. Maybe. He can explain what straw man means. He can tell you what, whatever. So like begging sure, I haven't taken the course. Something. I don't know exactly the contents. But but he's not going to be like showing the completeness of first order logic or anything. Like that. Yeah, <laughs> he, he's not going to understand anything like that. Um, he's not really, a logician at all. Really quickly, um, while we have you here, Alex, um, I'd like to uh, ask you for your critique. Um, I have another clip for you. Okay. This one's only like a few seconds long. But since you, since you do have some expertise in logic, I was wondering if you could, if there is a fallacy or there's some error <laughs> in the logic in this argument, if you could point it out to us. I'm going to play it. Hang on a second. How long is this clip? It's only 11 seconds. If it is the case that God, the Christian God exists, then I would believe that God exists. I believe God exists, therefore the Christian God exists. Do you need to hear it again, or are you still thinking? Said, if the Christian God existed, I would believe that he existed. I believe that he existed, therefore he exists, right? That's correct. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So it's if P then Q, Q therefore P. Q therefore P. That, that appears to be the form, yes. Of mm-hmm. Q. Cool. Do you need me to, you don't need me to spell I, that out, do you? No, no, I do, no, I do, no, I do. No, I no, do. do. <laughs> well, um, that's, that's, that's informally called, um, Affirming the consequent, right? Mm-hmm. So, Not according to Darth. <laughs> oh. Well, <laughs> but it is, though. I mean, no, sir, it's it, not. What's it called formally? <laughs> well, formally, um, so what's the clearest way to explain this then? So, for, so if we're saying it's a material conditional, right? So it's if P, then Q. Um, I think it's going to be difficult to make perfectly clear just by speaking would be much easier if I could draw on a whiteboard or something, but like um, each of the constituent propositions, that is P and Q, can either be true or false. And the way the material conditional works is that any combination of them being true and false renders the whole thing, the whole conditional being true, except the one combination where the antecedent, that's P, is true and the consequent is false, right? That's the only way that the um, conditional can be false. Every other combination is true. Um, So if you're saying the first premise is true, then you either mean P and Q are both true. uh, P is false and Q is true, or they're both false. That's what you mean to say if premise one is true. It must be one of those three combinations. Um, And if you're also saying the premise two is that Q is true, um, then what's the point is that, so if you're checking for validity, what you want to do is try and show 
whether the truth of the premises means that the conclusion has to be true as well. Um, and the way a logician would do that would be to, to um, write out both the premises of the argument along with the negation of the conclusion and see if any assignment of uh, truth values to the atomic constituent propositions is such that the premises and the negation of the conclusion are, are ever true together, right? And if they are, um, then the argument's invalid because the truth of the premises is consistent with the negation of the conclusion. So it can't be that the premises together entail that the conclusion is true. It's impossible for them to be true, but the conclusion false. So that's the test you want to run. And I guess if I get a pen and a piece of paper, I could write it out and try and say it out loud, but um, there's, no, there's not gonna be, um, like, yeah, it's basically there's going to be, okay, so I guess it's not too difficult because all we need to do is like, is there an assignment of truth values to those atomic propositions, which makes the both of the premises true and the conclusion false, the negation of the conclusion true, right? So the premise one is if P, then Q. Premise two is Q. And then premise three is P. So if we want the conclusion to be false, we'll say that P is false. So that means that P is false in the antecedent of the conditional, right? Let's suppose, and, and then the second premise says that Q is true. So the antecedent is P and that's false. The consequent, that's Q, that's true. In a material conditional, the whole thing is true in that, say, in that case. If the, like I said, the only way the conditional is false is if P is true and Q is false. But in this case, we've got Q is false and P is true. That means the whole thing is true. Second premise is true because we just suppose that P is true and the conclusion was false because we suppose, or at least the negation of the conclusion was true because we just suppose P is false to C. So that means you've got both of the premises true and the conclusion false. Um, so that just proves formally that um, the argument's invalid. So I guess I could explain it. If you could follow along, well done. Uh, if you didn't, don't worry about it, but there is, you could, you could draw it out in like circles and be like, look, this circle doesn't overlap with that circle. And you'd be able to see geometrically as well. Like it's provable black and white, it's definitely the case. So the argument's invalid, basically. It's just those premises don't tell you that the conclusion has to be true. So if P then Q, Q therefore P, that's just not valid. Doesn't mean P is false, but it just doesn't follow that P is true because the premises are true. P could, yeah, so... P could be false. One. If it rains, the grass will get wet. The grass got wet, and you can't then conclude that it rained because the sprinklers could have been on. Or yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. But that's okay. that's a, a decent way of understanding yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't mean but it didn't rain. Yeah, it's logically possible that it didn't rain. And differently, like, I mean, it's, take a different um, argument form. If we, if we say, um, if it rained, then it's wet. Second premise, it rained, right? Now it must be that it's wet, right? There's no, it's logically impossible for it, for those two oh, yeah. premises to be true, but it not to be the case mm -hmm. that it's wet. Um, so that's, that's all. I mean, you can see intuitively that that's valid. The one that Darth gave is, is a fallacy because it's, you know, formally speaking, the truth of the premises is consistent with the negation of the conclusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, he actually provided a proof that you're wrong. So, did he? Okay. Oh yeah, uh, he has a dizzying intellect. Would I mean, you? Um, yeah. Are you at all interested in talking to him again, Alex? I know it can be cumbersome mm -hmm. and tedious at points, but um, they're actually quite entertaining, and he's he, you know he's willing to engage you in a way which he usually won't engage other atheists. I think the thing with him is that he was just such an asshole to me after a while that I just. I just don't, I don't really enjoy having an, a shouting argument with someone, you know? It's Wasn't not... he saying that you were dishonest by the end? Like he was just claiming that you were dishonest and not, and like uh, pretending to misunderstand his terms? <laughs> uh, maybe. I think he was saying some stuff about like, um, you know, what's the wide, you know, context, interpretive context, the widest possible context for that all meaning and stuff like that. And it was just like, I just genuinely don't know what you mean. Um, I, I don't know what that means. And 
um, yeah, I think he, he either used it as an excuse to bail out of talking to me by just being so rude that I would obviously just go away and not bother him again. Or he genuinely doesn't believe me and thinks that that's some kind of, you know, textbook philosophical idea that I would definitely know about or something. So I don't know which of those two it is, but he was um, an asshole to the extent that, like, I don't really in enjoy that type of thing. So I don't really want to talk to him because he was a prick, basically. I mean, what yeah. am I getting out of it? Nothing. Well, what I don't want to be shouting him as a dishonest interlocutor. Oh, wait, are you saying you would if you got something out of it? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, if I enjoyed it, I might be more inclined to do it, but it's it's not a pleasant thing to just, like, have a shouting argument with someone. I don't really enjoy that type mm -hmm. of thing. So what about I a speaker's fee? What about a speaker's fee? What if you pay <laughs> me? Do you, do, do you yeah. enjoy money? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, I, I don't think, I don't think you'd realistically be able to give me enough money. <laughs> 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 wow! Uh, I like uh, that. Uh, <laughs> Clip it. Wait, do you mean logically? I mean, you're a philosopher, <laughs> PhD, right? So by that you mean, do you have fifty dollars? What, oh, what kind on. of modality are we Most talking questions. about? I'm just have kidding. I'm just kidding. Christ. You don't know how much money we have. Everyone yeah, has Haiti. Money. Well, Haiti, I'm just, I'm just messing has, around. I would put Haiti in, has, like, uh, if it were an actual of formal. Workers. Like a like, well, not necessarily even a. Form. What's the number, Alex? It just gives a number. <laughs> we'll, we'll just we'll crowdsource it. We'll, we'll do it. We'll make it happen. Look, yeah, the we'll thing is, he, does, he doesn't really need to be paid anything because, like, you represent <laughs> like a merit badge, right? So he's motivated to to <laughs> debate without money. Whatever I mean, happened Jack to charity? Was like a thousand. Like, wasn't wasn't he? Or well, yeah, Jack? That's true. Yeah. I mean, like what? Would like five hundred do it? No, I, I think no. five five figures is a well. Oh, five figures. Oh, oh, does that include? Does that include <laughs> oh, because that the pockets is so difficult. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Five figures. We could. Yeah, yeah that's fair. Haiti, let's meet offline. Talk about this. Uh, uh, no, that's too rich for me. <laughs> no. For five Haiti. figures, there's going to have to oh, be a weigh-in. And you're gonna have to take pictures, like touching noses, <laughs> looking at yeah, each other yeah, very yeah. angrily. It's gonna yeah, have to I, be really hyped for five. I years. think you'd have to like all question what you're doing with your lives if you did raise that type of money for this. But that's fine. That's all we do. That's what we do. We question our lives. We make bad decisions all the time. That's how we got here. <laughs> well, hey, you you'd be the one debating. Don't look at us like that. Come on. <laughs> You're going to have to start a foundation for this sort of thing, Tom. Isn't there some sort of craft beer that you really wish you had? The rabbit foundation. <laughs> Very for difficult the, to get. The rabbit foundation for facilitating combat of the mind. Or some shit like that. Have you ever no, listened I, I, to, you know, Alex, there's like a playlist of uh, him talking to sort of like PhDs and prominent atheists like Graham Oppie oh. and Lawrence Krauss, et cetera. Have you ever no, heard I, those? I'm not interested in that, really. I mean, I think it's just very easy to like steamroll or bamboozle someone like Graham, who's just like a nice man, who's not expecting yeah. like that type of vibe. Do you know what I mean? Like, obviously he is, um, he would, if he decided to sit down and like get it super into uh, pre-sub, he would come up with a really like ingenious uh, angle that would be really insightful and, and stuff like that but is he gonna like best everyone in like one-on-one -on -one kind of verbal combat don't think so um so it's just kind of like right, cringe but, uh, embarrassing watching yeah, someone, someone like that. no no this this well, is 100 percent correct right so like um it's like discord debate tactics right like this yeah. like, cringe type of stuff here and like anyone who's not familiar with this like cringe stuff or isn't expecting it, they could be made to look foolish. That's not yeah, hard. Like that's right. like your average person in here who's doing this day in and day out could talk to like a PhD, uh, whatever, and probably make them look stupid on something. So I 100% agree with you there. But what's what is kind of interesting is that Darth doesn't see it that way. He actually thinks that like. Oh, like I used my Discord debate tactics on this guy and he had nothing. 
But when in yeah. reality, like Graham Oppie or Lawrence Krauss, if they were just given like a crash course on like these underhanded tactics, this is the type of thing he's going to do, say, blah, blah, blah. They would have, he, he would, Darth would be completely like ineffective on them. I, I think well, that Graham Oppie did really well. I mean, maybe that's just me. I think he did pretty good. Or just, just force okay. Darth to be the time debate. A proper time debate with actual controls that can lock him out, you know, when he's being a dick. That that would solve ninety percent of his tactical problems right there. Well, I mean, Darth could submit his um, his writing to a philosophy journal, right? Uh, That's also uh, another uh, way of doing. Uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know they had a kids section in those journals. Yeah. <laughs> I would pay highlight, to see that. That would be the highlight point. coloring section. <laughs> I think I have a uh, some footage of him defending his dissertation to the philosophy journal. If it is, well, I, case, I, 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 the, God, the Christian God exists. I, 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 I would believe that God exists. I believe God exists, therefore, the Christian God exists. Yeah. Murder. You wrote that one in his. I tried to submit a. I tried to submit a, a paper to this evangelical journal, and they um rejected it on the grounds that evangelical theologians don't care about precept which they view as disreputable <laughs> ouch oh, did you word. keep that letter <laughs> it's somewhere buried in my email I mean, this was an evangelical ago, journal wow was that philosophia christi no this so uh that journal is much more progressive than this one so oh, wow. I submitted it to uh, yeah. to Jets, which is the Journal of the Evangelical Theological Society. Wow, That's um, a cool name too. And oh. you have and to like get special too. permission to uh, <laughs> <laughs> you have to get special permission to publish there because they uh, only ordinarily allow people that like sign like a conservative statement of faith publish there. And um, wow. so I submitted a, a proposal, not talking about any of my own. Know, uh, views, but just being like, well, I would, I would present this argument against um, like Vantillian presuppositionalism, and I would also discuss uh, like Greg Bonson, and they were just like, we don't want that in our journal. <laughs> That's funny. Um, Alex, uh, if it would take you about five figures to debate Darth, would I be correct in sort of thinking that maybe to debate T-Jump, it would be six figures? Uh, um, <laughs> like, in a way, they're quite similar characters. Um, and they're both sort of... I guess maybe T-Jump's, like, more um, honest or something than Darth. I don't know, honest isn't quite the right word, but, like, he's more, I don't know... Maybe he does, like, try and change his mind and think things through. At least he, like, reads at least the Stanford Encyclopedia page, where I think Darth literally just listens to those <laughs> bands and debates. That's it. That's it. Um, so, I, again, I'm not particularly inclined to talk to T-Jump um, or do a debate Darth, with him. Darth actually has a really extensive philosophical and theological library. <laughs> um, he... Uh... Which, or which I out on crayon was, and everything. <laughs> well, no, so so I, I don't know how this was leaked, but at some point, Darth's Google Drive was leaked. And so I've looked through there, what's in there. Oh, dear. And uh, it's, yeah, it's a really extensive library. I, I have no idea what proportion of that he's actually read. Mm. It's all still marked as unread, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> it's actually the Wikipedia page for affirming the consequent of pasted over 100 times. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the rest of it is just trap porn, so, you know. Well, I have access I'm, to that, by the way. I'm glad to see that he's read both C. Dick and Jane and C. Spot Run. Um, that makes me happy. Yeah. I, actually, I was uh, happy that that got leaked, not just so I could see what the hell it is that Darth looks at, but, but also so that there, there's stuff in that Google Drive that I didn't previously have. So hmm. I was able to download like a bunch of things that I wanted, but yeah. um, <laughs> but like so it was really surprising that like 
like if he has read all the stuff in there, then he's extremely well read. I, I think the problem is probably that he like downloads a lot of things and then reads very little of it. Yeah, but I mean, I who doesn't? Right? I, if you looked at all of the PDFs on my hard drive, you'd think I'd read a load of stuff I haven't too. I mean, what? Of, well, all of the books on my shelf. Or something. Oh, Gus is disappointed. Right. <laughs> well, but, I, you but know, but Alex, I, I've, you know things. I know some things, um, but you, you know, <laughs> I'm not the type of person that reads absolutely everything. I often just read what I need to read. I'm quite opportunistic as a when I think about philosophy. I'm not just like going around comprehensively trying to read everything. Like someone once asked me if I normally keep like keep up with all of the new journal articles that come out, like in the top journals. Am I just regularly reading them? It's, it's like no, of course not. Absolutely not, right? I'm I'm not doing anything like that. When I read philosophy, it's mainly because I've been like spurred into action on a specific question. I just want to read up about that. So yeah, I'll read the bit of the paper that I need to most of the time. Unless it's good, in which case I'll finish the paper. But often I'll just like get to the point where they specify the thing I was wanting to know about or make the argument that I wanted to see or something, and that's it. So, um, but anyway, I don't know if Darth does any of that. Doesn't seem to me that he does. But then he does. He, the thing that's good, the thing that he's good at is, um, I can find if I accidentally like click on a video where he's talking. Um, it's it's actually surprising that often the arguments are different, and it's like, oh, this is a new thing, like a different angle. It's not exactly the same. I kind of feel like if I clicked on a Matt Slick video, it would be exactly the same like five years down the track, as I think with Darth, at least it modulated. And he used to be an evidentialist, I think, and then picked up presup. So he was capable of like mm -hmm. learning a new- yep. Yeah, that's right. Um, he was a evidentialist and then got like humiliated over and over again. And <laughs> yeah. found- this was this over him. Sort of story. But he, hmm. uh, he, yeah, so, he eventually like made his way to because like Jack knew him back when he was an evidentialist, right? <laughs> yeah, and he was asked, "Why did you? Why do you believe in God?" Because he and he answered, "Because of the design inference." So then we right. asked him, "What's the design inference?" And then he had to make a phone call <laughs> <laughs> to run an errand. All of so, yeah, so no, we were there was a lot of that. Dog. There was a dog. lot of that. We also asked him, you know, kind of like if if there could be evidence for God, what would count as evidence against God? Mm. And he actually wrote, well, we use the term falsify. What what observation would falsify the Christian God? And he actually wrote to Tim McGrew. Have I ever told you this, Alex? <laughs> he actually wrote to Tim McGrew and asked, how are Christians supposed to respond to this? And so Tim McGrew told them about the Duem Quine thesis. So like one day, he started talking about the Duem Quine thesis. <laughs> he was like dodging the whole issue for like, you know, months. And then all of a sudden one day he said, you don't need to, you know, there doesn't have to be an observation that can falsify anything because you can't falsify anything because of the Duem Quine thesis. <laughs> cool. So he found out about auxiliary ad hoc hypotheses. I'm just like, sweet. Yeah, but That's then cool. Ozzy, Ozzy asked him the question. You know, Ozzy sort of explained to him that, look, if there's going to be evidence that can count in favor, there has to be evidence that can count against, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why they're asking this question about falsification. And he said, oh, yeah. you're talking about falsify falsifying Christianity? That would be uh, that's simple. All you'd have to do is find the body of Jesus of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. But he, he fucked himself. Wait, because, wait a minute. <laughs> because, yeah. Then it was like, well, wait, why were you spending all this time it's talking about him. the Duham Quine thesis? He got really badly embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> so, he just oh, left yeah. the call. He was in the call with Ozzy. He just yeah. left. It's like I sounded so smart for four he seconds. He didn't even say he had to walk the dog. He just <laughs> disappeared suddenly. It never, it never came back. That's funny. Internet trouble, I'm sure. 
Yeah. Alex, what what kind of advice would you give um, a less philosophically versed atheist to answer Darth's questions? Because he does continue to kind of terrorize atheists with these questions, and they don't they don't know what to say. Do you have she's any asking for, tips for how to how to combat the, the script? She's asking for a friend, by the way. <laughs> asking for a friend. I obviously <laughs> can do it easily. Um, <laughs> other people, you know. Um, I think it's, well, I think like you need to know what the script is going to be quite well. So, um, I think often I use this as an analogy because I'm so boring, but I think about it as like, um, learning a chess opening, right? Where, um, some chess players like mix up the openings that they play all the time. Certainly some of the top people like Magnus Carlsen often plays really offbeat random openings and it makes it difficult to play against him. I mean, in a way, anyway. Um, but some players at like club level, they'll just be, they'll just always play the same opening. So like, you'll just know that like Terry just is a King's Indian player and he just always plays that regardless of what his opponent is playing. And if, and Darth is a bit like that, even though I said he mixes it up a bit, um, it, the key to, I think succeeding is to like know his system at least as well as he does so that um, you don't get sort of surprised or caught out or like, you know, if you can see what's coming and you already have thought about he's going to put his bishop there and if he does that, I'll move the pawn up and then blah, blah, blah. If you've already got a plan ready, that will, that will help. I think it's probably the, the thing to do is to just not rush into it, but to like kind of prepare like you would prepare if you knew somebody's chess opening. Um, I don't think I've got the cheat codes for like, if he says X, then just say Y and you'll be fine. Um, but I think you just have, yeah, it's like one of those conversations where, because he's not, it's not really a conversation. It's like a fight that you have to, you have to do preparation before you go in. I think it's, it would be quite arrogant to think that you could just sort of wander in and just off the top of your head, um, negotiate your way through that kind of script that he's got. Um, so yeah, that would be my advice really would be prepare quite a lot, figure out what the script is. Yeah. Um, can I ask you a question of logic, Alex? Okay. Last question. And then I'm going to go to bed. So I've had, I've got, I've had a few of these in my time. Like, um, so for example, if you take the form of like affirming the consequent P in place, uh, P therefore, um, P that if P then Q, uh, Q therefore P, right? Um, but if we replace Q with like a tautology, like um, uh, P or not P, uh, oh, sorry, Q or not R, uh, sorry, Q or not Q, sorry. So we have P, mm -hmm. in, if P, then Q or not Q. Um, oh no, it would have to be the, the antecedent, the, like the left hand would have to be a tautology. So, because then if you're like, if you're saying therefore tautology um, and the left hand side of the implication is a tautology, then it would be valid, but also in the form of affirming, affirming the consequent. Do you see? I, I know I butchered that a lot, but do you understand what I'm saying? So you're saying if it was, um, if P or not P, then Q, um, and then, sorry, what are we doing? Affirming the consequent. Yeah, that's right. And then Q then it is a second Q. premise, and right. then therefore P or not P, and then that, that would be valid, but it would also be affirming the consequent. Um, would it? Oh, it'd definitely be valid because the conclusion is. Because there's no way that the true, conclusion right? could be false. Yeah, so obviously that's true. Yeah, okay. I agree. Yeah, so, but then also, like, people say, like, a notion of validity is like you can derive it from inference rules, right? But um, I think there are many cases like this where I don't see an inference rule. I've looked for them. Like, I don't see an inference to tautology. Like, for example, you could say premise 1P, conclusion P or not P. And that would be a valid argument, but I don't see any inference it would. that are being used. Um, so in, so I think there's, I don't know if it's a rule, but as such, so when people talk about inference rules, they mean um, in the proof theory, it's called natural deduction because um, there are other ways of proving theorems that don't involve referencing rules of inference. Like you, there's like a, a tableau method where you basically draw out a tree and or systematically go through the branches or whatever, and that doesn't involve any rules of inference. There's there's rules of how you draw the tree and what you do at different stages or whatever, but it's not quite the same. 
Um, and I think that in any, in any case, even if there's not a, a rule stated, um, at any stage in a, in a proof, you could introduce a new, as a new line any tautology you want at any point. And it's not going to make any difference to the validity or not of the argument. Um, right. So it'd be like tautology introduction or something if you wanted to give it a name. Right. And if you did, that would be completely in keeping with natural deduction. So yeah, and uh, also that would mean any like introduction. So P or tautology. Now that uh, disjunction is also a tautology, right? Um, P or um, tautology would also be a tautology, but it, I guess it would. My brain is slowing down because I'm um, approaching bedtime, but yeah, okay, let's say that's true. And so I guess, well, there's already disjunction introduction, right? So and for P, uh, you can introduce P or Q in a proof, like where you've got P on one line, any subsequent line, yeah. you can introduce P or, or Q. So obviously you could do that if Q is a tautology too. Um, so yeah, maybe I'm missing what you're saying. Yeah, or just a, just another funny fact like that would make the disjunction immediately a tautology rather than a, con a contingent. Well, would you mind repeating the argument, Orson? Which one? Oh, the affirming the consequent one? Uh, yeah, where you're saying there's an affirming of the consequent argument that is seems valid. So I don't see who I'm talking to. But um, yeah, the um, so the form would be P or not P implies Q. Q, therefore P or not P. P or not P, therefore Q. No, implies Q. So if P... Well, implies. Sorry, um, I, it's been a while. So if P, if P or not P, then Q. Q, mm -hmm. therefore P or not P. Okay. Alex, I just wanted to say thank you for coming by, sir. You're welcome That's anytime. Okay. We enjoy cool. having you. Please come back. Okay, cool. Um, so thinking about that argument, I guess you're right. It is valid. Um, so if it's like P or not P, if P or not P, then Q, uh, Q therefore P or not P. Um, obviously you could make, um, well, there's no way that the conclusion can be false. So there's no way that it, the premises could be true. Um, and the conclusion false. So it's, but it's still invalid, valid. isn't it? No, it's valid because no, there's no way the premises, the premises can be true and the conclusion can be false. And it, that's true just because there's no way that the conclusion can be false. There's no way. Well, could, hmm. Right, so if the premises are true, the right. conclusion is true. And that's, right. that premises follows just apology. because even if the premises are false, the conclusion is yeah. true. Right, the, the conclusion is true regardless of the premises. Right. But I think that... Like what's going on there is that actually um, it, it's not, so it's sort of, it's valid in that technical sense, but I suppose what's going on is it, it's highlighting how um, weak the entailment relation really is, that sometimes um, an argument can be valid when the premises don't actually have anything to do with the conclusion, because consider following, right? If P um, or not P, uh, then Q, um, Q, therefore R or not R, like that's also valid uh, for the same reason the first argument was, just because there's no way the premises can be true with, that, with the conclusion false, just because there's no way the conclusion can be false, right? But it shows you that the premises need have no relevance to the conclusion in terms of the validity of an argument, like entailment doesn't like mean literature. the premises are relevant yeah. to the conclusion. Um, and that did exercise a bunch of logicians in the 50s and 60s, this question of um, relevance. I think it goes back to um, C, uh, which one is it? C.I. Lewis has um, worries about that problem in like the early 20th century. And um, there's a thing called relevant logic. Um, and if I'm remembering correctly, that people who came up with relevance logic for some reason, I can't remember off the top of my head, realized that um, they had to kind of include uh, some non-standard models in order to maintain the kind of relevance um, reasoning that they wanted to. 
which were like um, inconsistent. So they were, they, what they did was effectively were quantifying over possible worlds and to some extent also some impossible worlds as well. Um, so that meant it was um, what logicians call paraconsistent logic. So it was only later that the paraconsistent logic was picked up by people like Graham Priest, who wanted to sort of advocate that contradictions could be through in the actual world. But before that, it was that people invented paraconsistency in order to model relevance relations better than classical logic does. And the reason they were doing that is because of the exact type of question um, that we were just thinking about there, where you've got a, a, an argument where the validity, um, it, yeah, like you said, it kind of looks like it's just embodying an invalid argument, like affirming the consequence. But what's happening is that you've actually got premises that are not relevant to the conclusion. And that's why um, it looks like it obeys that um, logical form. I mean, the simplest way to think about it is that the, the, the reason the, premise, the premises can't be true along with the conclusion being false is just that the conclusion is a tautology. So actually you could remove the premises altogether and you've still got a valid argument, right? So the premises are just not doing anything to guarantee that the conclusion is true. It's just true anyway, regardless. So that's what I mean by it doesn't have any relevance to it. So relevance logic strengthens up this notion of entailment so that it doesn't have that kind of weird feature. So hopefully that helps sort of flesh out what's going on there a little bit. I apologize, I'm quite sleepy, so I probably could explain that better, but hopefully I gave a little bit of flesh to it. How do we uh, how do we distinguish or disconnect um, no, 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 more questions. no more questions. We need to let oh, Alex go. To go in, indeed, in, well, it wasn't directed at him. It was more for the room, but that's fair. Okay, cool. Thanks, so Alex. thanks very much. I will talk good to you night. guys again another day. Cool. Take care, Alex. Thank you. Have a good night, man. Oh man, I have so many. I want to ask him what his views on modal bone or like logical monism and oh. his views on math. <laughs> Yeah, next time. Did you see Tom's math? trying to talk. Tom's trying to talk. Tom, we can't hear you. At least I can. Oh, sorry. I can. Sorry, yeah. I was being sorry. There we go. Albedo, uh, did, did you say math?